Right, this is going to be another episode of Snake and Banter. We are joined with the return guest, it's King T. I think, actually, you might be tied for the most appearances. I think you've done at least two, haven't you? I think this is my third, but I can only remember okay. my second appearance. I can't remember my first. Okay. I think it was a while ago. Probably just, you know, a bit shook talking to the Maui Snake in a, in a talk <laughs> show, you know. You know, in any moment he could say a nuclear level take, which just by being in a box on the same screen and associated could ruin your career as well and make you a, 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 a fool who knows nothing about the game and only says things to be contrarian and make people angry because everyone knows <laughs> that's obviously what you're doing. Isn't it? So, what do you want? He's far too bombastic. It's he is, isn't he? I know. <laughs> I know. I mean, King T and I hung out a handful of times in London, and he would just be, you'd have to make sure that he, we sit like at least arm's length away from each other. Okay. There's no way. If he get, he can't get in a picture with me. He couldn't get in a single yes. picture. I don't think we have a single picture together, actually. We have like two on my phone. Both look so terrible that I've never put them <laughs> okay. anywhere. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, exactly. And obviously, even though I, there's no VOD in it, so. A, we could be lying, but I was there. It happened. Me and King T did do a, a viewing party for the final of the recent EWC, where I sadly picked G2 to win, so that, the whole thing was a waste of everyone's time, but whatever. It was fun in some way. Well, the last map wasn't that fun, but actually the first map and a half was pretty good, right? It was pretty. It was somewhat yeah, entertaining. Yeah. It was back and forth. Yeah. Navi played some good Counter-Strike, and G2 played Deathmatch. It was great. Yeah. And also, it was essentially, if you think about it now, the like fuck Thorin Cup final because it was G2 with their lineup where I've said it won't work with snacks and bulbs in the final looking great before that match at least versus Navi, who obviously, even though, spoiler, this, I know this will blow your minds, guys, wasn't a major or a prestige event. If they ever lift a single trophy, well, I'm wrong on every point I ever made, apparently. So I also knew I could never win in this final. But in that way, <laughs> I'm sort of like Nico. Whatever, it's all good. Just why don't you know why? why I know why I shot at Nico as well. He didn't even, he wasn't even, he didn't even do anything wrong in this one. But I thought, you know what? He's, he's going to be my whipping point in this scenario. But here's the thing as people in G2 found out in this world, what is the most valuable thing, right? You can say whatever you want. You could say, I don't know, family, like you know, purpose, meaning. Well, you know what? A lot of people would say the most valuable thing is time, isn't it? Ooh, bit bit philosophical there if you think about it. Because with time, that allows you to do everything else you wanted to do in your life. So anything out there that can save you time is great. And as you can see by our sponsor here, Mando, at www.shopmando.com with promo code CS2, where you can get five percent off their best selling starter pack at this particular one. Obviously, thanks to them for supporting this show. They can take away all the problems of worrying about body order, which, spoiler, if you're a, someone who's in the gaming sphere and you sit in your room playing all day, you absolutely, if you aren't, put it this way, if you aren't aware you should be worried about body order, everyone around you is, you're just not aware of it. Because if you don't know, a little bit of science for you, the way your nose works, or olfactory senses, is actually, unfortunately, not based on whether something smells. It's actually based on changes in smell. That's why, famously, I'm sure you can all relate to this, sometimes, say, you've had, like, a plate that's left in your room for two days, you might not smell it when you're in the room, but if you go out for the weekend and come back, you will smell it the second you walk in that room. You'll be like, what? what's that? Something, because that's the way it changes. So my point here is, actually, I'll say when I was younger, I wish I'd have known more about this angle. I wish I'd have known that this is something where people can know if you indeed haven't done something for a few days or if you've been lazy or you've been eating bad food. So, so this is an example where you don't have to worry about all that. Mando will help you out in that regard. You won't have to worry about the order. Now, another thing that's interesting is, a lot of people out there, obviously, are just going to promise the world. Interestingly enough, Mando says they don't cover up order after the fact with heavy fragrance like certain other deodorants. What they do is it stops order at the source by blocking the bacteria on your skin from eating your sweat, which apparently is the actual cause of BO. Wasn't aware of that myself. What does this mean? It means Mando is clinically proven to control order for up to 72 hours. So Maui's used some of the Mando products. What did you think? Uh, I mean, I honestly love it because uh, it's the way that it works, I, I feel like is I, it seems like it's a different take on deodorant, but I'm just going to say flat out like the response is just my girlfriend loves it. She likes it a lot more than my last deodorant. Okay. And I feel like if a girl, a real girl said <laughs> okay. that okay. it's good, <laughs> okay. I feel like that should be uh, good enough. I would rather I'd rather yes. take her her saying that over 
even what we're saying it. So yes. take, like the, don't take my <laughs> advice, take her advice. I like the way in a way I've sort of targeted this, like the original demographic of the first ever esports competitors from like the 2000s. So it's like, you stink. <laughs> and you know what? There's girls out there. They actually like it if you do that. I've actually, we've actually gone all the way back to the beginning of esports in some ways. But <laughs> yeah. that is the thing because... The, some of the features of Mandor are it's aluminium free, baking soda free, cruelty free, dye free, vegan, clinically proven to control order, better than a shower with soap alone. 12 hours after a shower, the average man's order level was a 5 out of a 10, but on the same, oh, it's called like a grundle order level, apparently. Apparently, if somebody used Mandor, it was a 0 out of 10, so it did did what they said it would do. And, as I pointed out earlier, their starter pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, a cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice, like mini body wash and deodorant wipes, and free shipping, so you save money. It's not much expensive, and it's free shipping. I like the soap, personally. I use it in the shower. And yes, to get that, you can get a starter pack with our exclusive code that equates to over 40% of the starter pack, basically the $5 off. So just use the code CS2, as you can see on your screen here, at shopmando.com, S-H-O-P-M-A-N-D-O.com. Right, let's get into this episode then. So King T, we always start with the good. What is the good point you are bringing to the table here today? So my good is... Uh, quite simply, Mao's actually do have, in essence, a superstar. Okay. I think a lot of people have been excited or enjoyed watching Yimfat over the course of the last sort of six months as he's made his way into the main team. Uh, but the recent developments and his tra trajectory just have me convinced that he is just a superstar. We haven't all realized it yet. He's playing tough positions, and yet despite all that, he puts up insane numbers. Uh, the fact that he's doing it from these spots also opens up the rest of the map for the rest of the team to perform, to take other star spots and actually allow them to win more games. So I think Mouse Sports, maybe they don't even realize it themselves, but they have like the maybe the first support superstar, at least in CS2 and potentially in, back as far as CSGO. I mean, I'm not sure how much credit we want to give some of these former supportive lurkers uh, that we had in the back in those days, but this guy is on a new level. And I think, yeah, Yimfa, he's a new type of superstar. And I think we need to wake up to that fact. Okay. He's stellar. Uh, the clutch he had against Navi uh, in the semifinals was basically the only semblance of a T-side that Mouse had. Uh, the thing is, uh, I, if, if I want to just pump the brakes anywhere here, it's that, for me, Yimpat is exceptional in studio environments, lower stage pressure, but in terms of his performances at, in like arena moments throughout this year he's he's kind of fallen down uh, a pretty sizable amount and i feel like that that actually is um consistent with how he kind of came onto the scene because the first event he played with Mao's, he was clearly clearly nervous if you watched on Mao's nxt before he joined them you watched him on in that cologne debut that he had last year and it was like ooh, oh he's like definitely worse than uh and it's like is it because it's versus tier one opposition but i think it's just simply put he's just he just has some nerve issues right now because uh, this maybe wasn't that apparent at EWC because he was the only one that was holding his own against Na'Vi at the end of it all. But in the nine maps of arena games before that, he actually had a 1.03 rating for, for all of these games. And like, that's that's to me, like, you can, you can, you know, always invoke this like sample size argument here and there. But like nine maps over three, four series and being significantly worse than he is in studio matches is to me a sign that he has a little bit of room for growth, but that's something that if, you know, given that he's 17, he naturally just gets a little bit more composed over the years. Uh, he is going to be a, a huge force. He already is a huge force. He's one of the reasons that Maus are so consistent in group stage games and why they're making every playoffs, making deep runs so consistently. Why, if the entire tournament is run in a uh, studio environment like ESO Pro League or Bet Boom Dasha, that he's going to be a stellar player throughout that. Yeah, I mean, Yimpat, he's also kind of broken the mold for me in terms of what a support anchor player is supposed to do because I feel like I'm back in the day, you know, you had the tacos of the world who were obviously helpful in terms of the fact that they bought time and they like didn't die right away. But Yimpat kind of doesn't seem to care about that as much and he actually just kills people. <laughs> And that's way better. Like, I'll, I'll I'll take the guy that shoots two people in the face immediately over the guy that, oh, he bought time for the team. It's like, I, I think the game has 
moved on in some senses from that where you have to play to your skill set obviously like a nexa type player would want to just play for time try not to make a mistake but yimpat if he sees a fight that he wants to take he takes it and he wins it and i find that always to be more valuable when the name of the game at the end of the day is kill the opposing team there's a few angles on this one. Like, first of all, I think to me, the most incredible thing about Yimfa is people forget still. Guys, he basically joined around Cologne last year. That was around the time when he joined this team. So he's only coming up with about a year of top tier one player now. Then add in, so he wasn't experienced. Then add in, he's 17 years old. Like, that, it, it beggars belief. In some ways, I actually think this just shows how, like, fans really only do look at frags and highlight clips. Because in some ways, from the support or anchor position, isn't he sort of doing, like, a donk-style revolution of what the position can be? In the same way as traditionally, you don't think of an entry or the playmaker role or whatever people like to call it, where you play off the entry guy. People don't tend to think of that traditionally as the ultimate star in the world. People say now you have to be the AWP and be a bit passive. That's how you get all the frags, etc. So I think in some ways he is revolutionising the position. Because I agree with King T. If you go back in time, right, everyone, what's funny is all the fans, I know the reply guys, because they're all a worse version of me. They all think they have a memory and when they think, I'm like, ah, but what about this? And so I can already tell you immediately what they all said, King T. Here's the order of lists. So Soon as you went like a star from support don't you know who Zipnix is? And it's like, did you not listen to his <laughs> points though? Like Zipnix, by the way, as it Zipnix like would have the kind of numbers Yimfat puts up, like I'm going to say one out of every 15 tournaments, or he might have done it like three times in his whole career. And that would probably also, by the way, not check out with the eye test like a Yimfat performance, because here's the difference. If I had to guess, it's probably going to be one of those ones, a bit like when Glaive had Glopes, where the whole Astralis team just donked on a whole tournament, barely lost any maps, won a bunch of maps like 16-3, and essentially everyone just destroyed everyone, so he didn't die. Like, that's how I always thought, like, if you're in the ultimate, like, dominant team, you can always get your numbers pumped up. Your fans have been doing that. I mean, they've only won a couple of events. Obviously, it's not the big ones. And in fact, in their team, they have a couple of players who uh, people think are notorious chokers. So I don't think those numbers can be argued away by like any sort of context of great players of the past. And then I'd throw in there, if you even go to other names, like maybe someone wants to think about Perfecto at the end of CSGO. Perfecto never had numbers anywhere close to this. He was doing the eye test of the brilliant player of that role. I'd even say like the closest you could maybe come is if you go way back in the day to like Crim on Fnatic. There was an era where he used to anchor a lot of small sites where he could put up big numbers. But even then, I'll just throw this in there. That was literally the era, if you remember, where the Inferno CT side was defined by Fnatic and Envious and TSM. And everyone used to win 12 rounds out of 15 on CT. So, spoiler, like, that was the ultimate way to get kills. Like, if you think about it, right? If you're amazing at playing B anchor on Inferno and they're going there loads of times and, there's, and you're going to win 12 CT rounds, you could going to get a lot of kills. That's why, famously, the one I always used to give the example of was Happy used to play off NBK, who was the anchor of the Inferno site, and Happy used to just get 30 kills a game because all he was doing was, while people looked at NBK, he shot them inside the head. And I used to tell him, like, listen, mate, it's cute, but you know that isn't actually being the best in the world in a position. Like, you're basically the best beta in the world. So I actually don't think there's any co historical comparison I can come up with, King T, because the difference is mm. they're either amazing anchors or support players, or they're fraggers not really playing anchor or support. He's kind of doing both. I agree with you. The numbers, I mean, he's just done it so much now, mate. And at such a young point in his career, he clearly is just like something we've never seen before. And I'll even throw this in there. He even has an interesting quality that I don't think people maybe appreciate. I've been given the example, it reminds me of Device a bit, which is back in the day, famously, obviously, Device was the ultimate player labelled a choker, right? But what people never understood was he choked in the context of, like, he wouldn't have a big performance in a big game. If you put him in, like, a major semi-final, maybe he'd lose the round. But what's weird is if you ever watch Device's gear, I think this is very compelling for the Infat, if you watched a random game, though, if you just went and watched, like, a random DreamHack summer in the group stage against, I don't know, Na'Vi or something, dude, Device won the most clutch players you'll see. He would win a 1v1 all day long, win a 1v2 lots of times. So I think also an interesting thing with Yimfat is, he is clearly very clutch, but I also think, by the way, he actually chokes too. I think he's one of them that also has big performances. So I, I think those are two different things. My point is, yeah, if you put him in a big stage map, he might disappear sometimes. You put him in a random game, he'll win a billion clutches. Because I always say, the thing with this player is, 
Dude, he doesn't even have particularly crazy combat skills to me. It's just his fucking poise is crazy. Like, he really does look like... Here's what I wish you could do with this player. This is the player I wish we could bring back the gimmick that people tried to introduce in esports 20 years ago of heart monitors. Because this guy seems like the guy where, like, the joke is they would think he was on that drug that, like, snipers take. It feels like this guy's heart rate must never go over, like, the resting rate, you know. He just feels... He, he has that Zipnix feel where he just feels like, like a, an impersonal computer that just does the right play and I'll tell you what that's mad underrated for being in clutch situations because I think even star players bro even people like the Nikos of the world sometimes like flummox a moment like that and fuck it up and you know do the wrong thing or get in their own head and think oh that guy's always in the right spot and they double and triple back this guy's perfect for that. So, no, I agree. I think he's mega, mate. I mean, I'll even say, before anyone says, can you be a star from support? Because in theory, obviously, support's by definition a facilitative role and you're usually taking the bad roles. I'll just say, I think you can't in general. That's why that role exists. But the point is, we're talking about someone who's transcended the role. And I'll give you a few quick examples if you know other esports. So, if you were ever a fan of Dota 2... There were play if you remember in Dota 2, it's about the farm distribution, right? So you have the two traditional carry positions, is one position carry, and then obviously mid lane, right? They're nearly always the players you want to get fed and carry the game. And famously, off lane, traditionally is usually someone just scrounging around for whatever farm they can get, and often actually sometimes just helping the supports, etc., and just grouping, right? But if you know the player Zai, who the Swedish player, this guy can farm an off lane and be like a fucking carry in the game. He was like unbelievable how we could just do that all day long. If you've ever seen in League of Legends, there's a player right now who plays for the Korean team T1 where Faker plays. He's a support player called Carrier, and he actually revolutionized the position. As in at support, where you normally play like healer champions, he would play AD carry champions, which is normally what your role partner, lane partner plays, and he would sometimes do more damage than anyone else in the game from support because he like revolutionized the position. And the last example is if anyone watched the original Overwatch League, League. There was a player who played the supportive role there where he was playing the Zenyatta and he was the MVP of the whole league. He actually would, no joke, do more damage than anyone else and he essentially was like a carry in this analogy from being like a defender in football or something. So in the same way, I'll end on that note, King T. In the same way as I would say, absolutely, Paolo Maldini was a star football player. It doesn't matter that he was a defender. He was cracked at that position. Though. So I think, I think it's a great mm. point. Do you have any more of this? You, I mean, obviously, you're somebody yeah. who can do a whole 20-minute video. Mate. Give us some more thoughts on Yimfa. What do you like about him? Yeah, so just to touch on some technical things, like the reason he's able to nonstop get frags from terrible positions, terrible scenarios, is that he's just good with an, every single weapon and always knows exactly when to swing and take a fight. Like if right. you see him like with an MP9 on the B site of Dust2, if there's a smoke anywhere, he's going to play around it. And at the exact right moment, he's going to swing it and kill two people with an MP9. So that level of understanding and feel, I think, because it's got to be intrinsic. He's 17. Like, He's barely finished yes, school. Exactly. I don't think he's studied every demo. He's just got that feel of when to swing and when to take a fight. And to touch on the arena games thing, I consider it a privilege if I'm on a team where my anchor and my support is a 1.03, you know, the bare average for anchors yeah. in the big games. Like if he chokes down to that, we still have a chance to win every yes. single tournament yes. if every other position steps up. So I think, yeah, Mal's have found themselves a tree and his academy demos pretty much looked the same. That's the scariest part. As far back as 15 years old, even playing on Finnish no-name teams, he still looks this poised, right. he still looks this complete, and he still looks this smart. Like, this man was solo controlling, like, nuke lobby and ramp, just on the T side, in academies. Like, he didn't ever look like he wasn't going to be a complete pro. That's what's crazy about him. I think we need to test him, like find out what he's made of because mentally he's above a lot of other players, even who've been veterans in the scene for a long time. That just reminds me, right? This is an inside joke. I don't know if he's ever heard it because it, it was before his time, to be fair. There was a commentator really, really back in the day. I'm going to say like 2016 or 2017 because it was from an eco clip. And this commentator wasn't some top level commentator. In fact, I don't even remember his name. And I remember usually everyone's name. And famously, a lot of us in the casting and talent scene used to make fun because there's a lot of in jokes that people repeat because they're just things you remember. And this guy, there was a clip where he goes, Nico, what are you made of, my man? And that just became, I think Henry G's done it. Like, you know, that became like an in joke, basically. 
But the joke is, that is actually the question I would like to ask him for. That is the question. What are you made of, my man? Because I know what you made Also, by the way, low key, just like Zipniks. Here's, this is like a slightly BM explanation, but that is my whole brand. The other thing that is gangster about this guy is, you know, when you say Zipniks, I know Zipniks. I wouldn't say he's a friend. We've been a little bit contentious. But he, I can talk to him. I can get away with saying this. Right? I actually always thought like 1% of what makes Zipniks intimidating is that he looks like a mega nerd with a giant Jimmy Neutron head. Like, that's perfect for what he's doing, though. Like, remember, if I'm saying you're having some stud Nico, like, best rifler in the world, lose a 1v1, you also want it to be against someone who just looks like a complete fucking nerd. And the other thing about Yimfa is, guess what? He has nailed it. He looks like the person in a 90s James Bond film who they go to to hack into a satellite. Like, he is the <laughs> perfect aesthetic. Like, I would even say to him, Yimfa, please, don't do that thing. You're going to do it in two years. Don't go to the gym yet and sort of clean up your whole image and get the laser that. For now, <laughs> Stick with what you're doing. Because again, if I wanted someone to hack a satellite, make a virus, you know, like you're the guy, but forge your passport. You've got it nailed. You've got that aesthetic nailed. And that actually works for your role. That will make you seem more intimidating. Like, who even is this guy? It's brilliant. I love it. I actually love it. I think that's one thing that we we haven't really played that up. I think in the in Counter Strike that the physical action that these guys are doing does look rather nerdy. Where you just like if you if you just took a shot of it and didn't show gameplay footage, you'd just be like, that's just a dude on the computer. And if you actually just took footage of Yimpat and then just cut it up with kind of like James Bond hacker footage, that'd be perfect. Be yes. Perfect. Exactly. I mean, put it this way, I'm already immediately seeing him play the role that, like, Alan Cummings played in GoldenEye, where he was that guy, you know, the fucking computer hacker guy with the glasses. He could just be a better version of that. Like, if anything, Alan Cummings is too good looking, and they did the sort of cheese all that, <laughs> and just put glasses on him, didn't they? He's a fucking beautiful man, so whatever. Right, yeah, he... now let's move on. Maui, what is your good point? Yeah, this just got announced, actually, right before we started recording this one, so I had to switch up my topic, and I feel like this is such a huge upgrade to already such a prestigious tournament it's that for iem cologne for this year and i'm hoping for for the future forever for all iem prestigious events there are no bo1s they've removed esl has removed bo1s from iem cologne and so what was before a ridiculous play-in stage that led to some crazy teams getting through or taking down some some top rosters here and there doesn't seem like that's as likely anymore. I know people, the thing The thing is that BO1s, there's been a long debate in this space about like, oh, well, the better team won, but it's like, that's not that, That's not really what BO3s are about. And let me let me just give my spiel before about why BO3s matter, because you can't, you can always, always say no matter what, oh, the better team won. But if, if the thing is that one of the big advantages of top professional teams is that they have a deeper map pool. They can counter pick, they can punish pick, and for lower level teams in many of the cups that you're playing you're playing a lot of bo1s up to like esca ecl basically esl challenger league you're playing bo1s throughout that league and so you're you're more used to this format and you can get away with the fact that some of these teams only actually have four map pools because you get usually three bands in a lot of these online cups you, because they're bo1s and so the thing is that sure it's up to the top team the favored team to actually play into the fact that they can punish pick they don't always do it which is why sometimes we get some stupid results at majors where it's like why don't you just punish pick and then they just said we went with our comfort but uh, uh, going back to the main point it is huge for cologne to have no bo1s played whatsoever at the entirety of the event i feel like that's just such a massive upgrade it's going to make the the beginning of the tournament feel so much more valid in terms of the results and it's going to make me believe in the results so much quicker because i feel like even a couple years ago when say like ihc now the mongols won a couple bo1s early on against teams like fury i was like Eh, I feel like that could just kind of happen any day. And it took me, took me, probably took other people a little bit longer to jump on that hype train. When in reality, maybe I could have jumped on it earlier. But, but the BO1s just made me think it was a little bit random. Nowadays, I just have to respect the results. Just have to throw my hands up in the air and say, okay, the winner, the winner was the better team today by a significant margin. Yeah, what's odd is that this is mostly just a change for the play-in. Like... And I guess I was, I was trying to scroll through quickly as you were talking to find if there were any big upsets in play-ins that really affected it. But it doesn't really matter if there weren't any. What matters is that we actually just need to future-proof this, ironclad this. We need to play BO3s all the way through, especially if we're on MR12. Um, I think this is more of a broadcast note, but if we're on broadcast watching a series of BO1s in MR12, it's kind of just kind of lame i'm gonna be honest the games are over so quickly it feels like the pistol rounds just dominate everything at least when you get a full series there's a chance for teams to mount comebacks create actual like 
counterplay and the game plans. There's something going on there. It, BO1s can be a bit rushed and a bit just empty in the, uh, in the in the vibe and the feeling. So I'm, I'm glad they're bringing it back in. I'm always worried in the play in BO1s because, you know, a lot of these teams are going to be lower tier rosters, teams I've watched try to come up. It's nice to legitimize their results when they do finally get upsets. I know a lot of people are resistant to that idea. Like on the other side of the spectrum, there's those who believe in BO1 results without any sort of uh, double check, without any verification. They'll just accept it as uh, gospel. But then the other side thinks people who refuse to accept a tier two teams made it up until they've beaten everyone in a BO3. And you're like, okay, fair enough. So I do like this. I think it's going to be a, a change for the prestige and the aura around Cologne. I don't think it'll, it'll have realistically had too much effect on the results, but hey. I'm glad the play just got a little bit longer and a little bit better. I actually love this move. I mean, first of all, I already was actually a big fan of the playing development that they added those years after the online era where I always thought, it's actually, people don't realize that is actually genius because essentially what you did there is you would already have had the equivalent of the playing. That would just be the end of the online qualifier. But it's not on LAN and you don't have all the professional setup. And then obviously it'd be like days before or weeks before the actual tournament. So what I think is awesome about the playing angle is it's just a way where like, if you think how many teams already get to play at these massive ESL prestige events like Cologne and Kanavitsi. They already pretty much nail all the big teams anyway because they use world rankings, at least they did back then. If So if you add in playing where you can then also prove your value, it just means you almost always get the best teams at Cologne and Kanavitsi. It's actually, it's proven to a mixture of seeding, using ranking for invites and then playing. I actually think that is like, you've sort of compromised in the right way, but you've covered all your bases. Like someone can prove themselves today or they can just be good over the last few months or they can just be like a direct invite anyway. So like, uh, it's actually a mega system in my opinion. Also, I actually do think other t tournament organizers should give some thought to this. You don't have to do it as full on as ESL because they obviously invite like loads of teams for the plane. But the thing I can't believe, I genuinely can't believe, except I do know the reason why I'm saying that rhetorically. I know the sort of mediocre minds who run these events. I can't believe that Blast never thought this one through, bro. You know, the most obvious thing Blast should have done is you just do like a mini version of this one day before your Blast finals. Now, again, it doesn't have to be 16 teams. You could have just done like four teams and two teams get to be in your event. I think that would also have been such a clever approach because I can tell you the actual real best teams in the world who weren't in your circuit. So in the past, it was like the spirits, the answers of the world. They would have gone because they know they'd get through. If they go and you tell them basically, look, you might not be in the event, but it's like a play. And if you come a day before Blast, you have to play against the Mongols in a best of three. But if you win, you're in the Blast event. They'd do it because they'd probably qualify. Then they'd probably win Blast itself, wouldn't they? all go deep. So... I actually think the plane already was a brilliant idea. The best of three angle just makes it sturdier. Now, as you say, Maui, this is the part people always miss about upsets. The same fan who goes, hey, stop hating. They beat the team that is better than them. One, none of us will complain if it's the best of three. I can just say, look back in history. When do we ever complain when a real team loses like that? Like even when G2 got upset at some of those majors, I still always had to say... At the end of the day, you have to accept the result. When FaZe Clan lost all those times to Bad News Eagles, I couldn't go fucking format. Oh, wait, that's just totally legitimate. They beat them in a full best of three. It was always legit. And then also, as Maui just said, it just means you can actually gain more as the underdog, you idiots. Like, as you say, IHC, when they did the odd BO1, you were just sort of like, ah, is that like the other team didn't expect them? Did they not get... No, no, when when they then came along and they were winning actually over Fury at like best of threes and playing teams like big and real best of threes, and do, well, then you knew they were legit. You already got a taste of what we now have seen where they fully blossomed. And then I'd also just say, you hinted at it there, but people always get the framing of the difference between a BO1 and a BO3 just fundamentally wrong. There's two things. One, they do that dumbass thing, which is, you know what, you know, this is actually one of Lopez's classic arguments. He'll go, well, when two great teams play, then you win your map, they win their map, and it's just the decider. So it's basically a BO1 anyway. And it's like that word basically just did all the heavy lifting there, mate, because yeah. I've watched Counter-Strike a long time, and I can tell you one of the hallmarks of a great team is you just win 2-0 and there's no decider. That's actually another reason it helps you test your map pool. Because think about it, right? You get to pick. There's all, I could only ban one map, then you get to pick, in theory, your best map. If I can beat you on that, don't I deserve to sort of win 2-0 and not be fucking around on some middle ground map? Because that that's the other thing they always forget Maui. They act like a BO1 is the same as map one. No, no, a BO1 is only like map three. You've already had a bunch of bands. In fact, it's worse than map three. Because even map three could, in theory, still be your third best map if you're lucky. If we're in the old system where you ban down a BO1, I can always get it to the middle ground map. 
by definition, because I have three bands, and he can only band fit. So I think people have always misunderstood. It's not even just the BO1, it's also the veto format that encourages upsets, unfortunately. Whereas, if you think of teams like Spirit, bro, there's a reason why you could put a billion teams against Spirit and so few of them could ever upset a BO3. Whereas if you put them, here's an obvious example, guys. Think of the sort of maps that a Spirit might play as the third map. Bro, if you put a billion teams against Spirit on a Mirage, they're going to lose the odd one. Or a dust tills it. They might lose one of those. They won't lose the best of three, though. I'll tell you that. So I think it's a great one. I think it's another example of where ESL's just done a really good job. And then, as I say, I also like the angle that now when the teams are on the rise, they don't have to just win a BO1 and then lose the real game. If they win these BO3s, then think of some of the teams we did see. So people don't know. Teams like Spirit had to actually come through that to go through Katowice. Mongols is an IHC were obviously a classic example. I'd even say if you go back in the day, actually big used to be fucking merchants in these planes. They pretty much always used to qualify. They'd usually nearly always get one sort of team that looked like they could be good enough and knock them out. So I think it's brilliant all around. It's good for the underdog because it gives you legitimacy. It's good for the favourite because it, it means you don't have some silly banana peel scenario where you just trip on one map that's too loosey-goosey. And also... As I implied there, if there was some way, I don't know what it would be, that you could somehow veto without it being unfair like that, I wouldn't hate a BO1. It's not like it can't be played. It's just I think the veto thing kills the BO1 thing dead. Like, once you know that and you understand that principle, it's just not CS. Like, essentially, everything we judge about teams, like, we remember, we want them to prepare on home maps and to have studied the opponent and to break what he's got. We don't want them to just go... Who can frag best on Mirage? Like, that's garbage. No one wants to see that. that that's, like, that's the least of CS. You know what I mean? That's, that's not what we all get up for in the morning. Yeah. Right, and also, go on. I, I, well, one one last thing, no, even you, I mean, going deeper the game, go on. Yeah, the the game theory side of it is that like certain tournaments for Bo ones have different veto structures, actually, which is kind of stupid. But I don't know if people have really looked into some of those ban, ban, ban features. But it's just that I think Valve has introduced this style where it's the starting team bans two, then the next team bans three, and then the next team bans one down to one map. But before it was actually just alternate alternating yes. ban 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 and so there was like a there's just a slightly and, and you don't really I, I mean i'm sure every team should read the rule book but sometimes you don't really you don't iron out your game theory for the two, two different types of bo1 oh, no. veto structures yes. as you probably should but on but like now bo3s everybody knows how it works like there's no questions about it whatsoever plus i all I, I know what you're talking about i also remember when they've done that type of format you're talking about one of the worst things about it was whoever came up with that fa format never actually sat down and thought about the game theory because i've seen tournaments where they tried to use that as the way to give the advantage the upper seed, right? But sometimes they'd fuck it up. Like, I'll give you an example, Maui. There's actually many cases where if I'm the team with the deep map pool, I'd rather be the one that does the last one who picks the map, basically. I'll take that angle. Then I get to see you burn your maps. For, like, it, the problem with it is it's not as obvious as to who the edge goes to. So I also think those, you're right, no one's practicing for that. No one's game planning for that. You're just turning up and you're just at the mercy of whatever that weird format is. Yeah. Right. My good point is actually quite unusual because normally... I never actually sort of go down in the tears, do I? I'm, a, I'm very much known as an elitist. I've branded myself as that in many ways. So what might actually shock you is, I'm mean, going to even have to read the fucking lineup of this team. Because believe it or not, that's right. For my good point, I'm being serious. My good point is gaming gladiators entering scenes. <laughs> so you're all thinking, what? So I'll read out the lineup for you. This is the lineup. The lineup is, basically, spoiler, it's just Nikidos and Roy from the old Copenhagen of Flames. But then they're with three players that were from the Danish scene, Nodios, Queenix, and Kragen, right? Now, the reason why it's quite sort of they also got Castle, the old coach of Astralis. Now, the reason why I say Gaming Gladiator is entering the scene is my point. There's a bunch of angles on this. Is one, if you know Dota 2, Gaming Gladiators is one of the absolute best teams that has been for like the whole like last two years, basically. So like that org has put in serious work in that game and had like almost like, if you don't know, they were one of the teams where like they didn't win TI, but they were like the best team for the rest of the circuit, pretty much. Like they had an amazing run. So one, I always want orgs that in theory have had success in esports to enter CS because you want to see if they hire the right person, if they get a Kassad type person, someone might be able to build them a squad. Someone might know of the scene. We've actually got, by the way, CS, particularly compared to a lot of games, got a lot of good scouts in my opinion. People have the eyes that the, like the people who found wrinkle and all these guys that you never know until they get to the top teams and then the other angle is a subtle one i think people are going to miss this bro i'm not a fan of ecstatic i didn't give a fuck about them because they never could have done anything at the major but i am a fan in the sense that it is actually a team trying to pay their players and all be from denmark i'm a big fan of that so since this is an all danish lineup bro i want there to be an all danish lineup that hopefully is just below the top 20 because here's the obvious reason why guys then when 
when someone like a Blame F or a Cadian is available, let's just send them there. When Config's there, let's just send them there. Pick the two or three players that are good. Let's add in a couple of other ones. We all know, like, right now, the actual angles become inverted. The min-max now probably is go and get a regional team, and Denmark and Sweden are probably the best for this. And if you look into the right one and have the edge of them speaking Swedish or Danish and have their culture, that probably actually can overcome not being as good fraggers. So I think, conversely, now that everyone does a poor man's face slash mouse approach to building teams, I actually want there to be more people who go back to the, like, original ground swellings and make a Russian team, a Danish team, a Swedish team, because I actually think it's a good way to, like, gather the new talents and use the old ones. And right now, like, it's obvious that aside from Astralis, Denmark's irrelevant in CS right now, but you have to know there's got to be talent out there. And the other reason why, finally, is, look... I won't pretend I think all these players are dope. But I do actually think both Roy and Nikodos are totally serviceable fucking players. I mean, they're overqualified for this team. They probably could or should be in an OG or something like that or ENS or something. So I actually think also you've got some pretty good pieces to start with. Like Roy's a veteran. By the way, as we've talked about a million times, Nikodos is actually just good at CS2. He's just a good rifler. So I even think like, it's not like this lineup is the one I'm going to be a fan of. But I like the potential that if you keep upgrading this lineup and there's going to be a bunch of Danish people out there, get them in. By the way, here's one last obvious angle to throw in another reason why I'd love a team like this to get half decent is then you could also just put like a glaive in there too there's so many angles people aren't thinking about that we can actually use and sort of like reclaim some of the Danish talent in the scene whereas the difference is no matter how many times you tweet it glaive probably is never playing off for fierce clan or G2 guys that's just that's just the nature of the game right now is that ship has sailed so you actually need teams like this if you want them to come back and be relevant again you weren't, you weren't yeah, expecting that, were you? You weren't expecting that. That's more your wheelhouse, that. mate. Yeah, you did, and I'm, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm shocked you're so positive. But most importantly, you're positive about the org more than the players, which is yes. fine, actually. Um, I don't mind that side. I have no idea how good the players are. Is this not that good a lineup or something? Are they not that good? It's, it's okay. So it's the ecstatic roster from sure. like four months ago because they were picked up in like April as a five-man unit by Gaming Gladiators. Or gaming. I think it's Gaiman or something. I'm not sure. Mate. Is it spelt weird? Yeah. Well, I think it's Gaiman. I think it's Gaiman. It's Gaiman. their problem if we mispronounce it. Just spell it right. Um, yeah. But more true. importantly, uh, yeah, the roster was a bit odd because I didn't rate the high end talent, but I liked the IGL. I thought they had a good coach. And they've just cut the IGL and brought Nikodos into Orp. So I was like, okay. okay. All these are a bit, okay. a, bit, a bit questionable to me. So there's any question marks left now as to who's actually going to be calling. Uh, why you're signing Nitos as an AWPA, and if they're actually going to ever make more moves to try and fix the rest of the roster. Because if they do have that pedigree from those two, maybe there is more uh, coming down the line. Because I personally had no idea who they were when they came. No, no, fair enough. Yeah. I'm not a Dota 2 follower. I never got into those sorts of games. Sure. But I like the coach. I think they had a decent structure before, so maybe they can carry it over with a different guy calling. Uh, but that's why I think I'm a bit meh, miffed. But this is the perfect team, yes, as you said, to reclaim Glaive. I mean, if Ents continue on their, yeah, their not-so-great trajectory, he probably is going to want to hit the eject button. And this team isn't that bad. I mean, despite me flaming their talent, uh, what they were able to do with those players, they're a Danish five-stack. They are polished. They do play well off each other. And they were able to get results and qualify for real events. So this would be a pretty good place for him to go. And especially now that they are showing him that they are able to go and acquire solid Danish talent. He doesn't have to just go to TSM. He now has choices. There's now multiple teams in the second tier of Counter-Strike who are full Danish, who have legit players, and who play a decent brand of Counter-Strike. So, no, it's not just Gaiman Gladiators doing this, but it is great to see it happening. And yeah, potentially we could rescue what remains of Glaive's career and potentially see, in my opinion, a comeback of an IGL who's desperately needed, and that's Bird from Sky. But I think there's going to, he's, okay. a, he's a controversial figure with a lot of uh, baggage, I think, that comes with him. But still, I think he's, his mind for Counter Strike is wasted, not currently leading one of these teams. Fair enough. Well, you know, I mean, this, the problem is we haven't got enough spaces for all the snacks of the world. So how are we going to fit Bird from Sky in there? What, what, what? Come on, Bob, what do you think about this, Bowie? <laughs> well, first of all, yeah, surprising you ever even decide to talk about a team that's not in the top top 20 so uh congrats to you thorin you know uh this i mean i did try i don't even fucking know but i'm saying anything about the players but you know i, I got it you did admit that it's just about nikodaz <laughs> roy and the org itself but yeah i think you've got a better chance than kraken's mum than kraken himself i mean she was a bit of a meme on twitter once so that's about oh, it right. okay. I, 
I, I will say I will say with this team, I mean, I haven't I just haven't seen anything. OK, well, let me let me get to the good part first here. I mean, yeah, gaming gladiators is huge. I mean, they've had they have teams in like 15 different games or something like that. Like, I I know that they were huge. They're huge in Dota. They still are. A great I know they're one of the partners with the EWC. I know they're one of like the so it actually implies you're a big org in theory, I think. Yeah. I mean, they got they got teams in like Rocket League and Fortnite and stuff, too. So, yeah, they, they've got a lot of different people in different places that are working on stuff. And I feel like for this this team, though, um, I'm kind of I kind of have some positivity about it. I, I, I know that losing Patty is a little bit weird for them because that was their in-game leader. And it was the only he was one of the few names I remember. I feel like I, when I was watching the Major, Kragan and Patty were the only two names that people were even remotely positive about. And now, and I do remember that Salazar was just very poor as an opper. Like, that's putting it lightly. He was he was one of the, I'd say, of teams in the top 30 around that time. He's probably in the bottom five of oppers. So I feel like this is this is a big upgrade. I'm, I'm glad to see that Nikodaz is there. I'm glad to see that there's a national Danish lineup that's... Uh, coming into play here uh and that's getting a better backing overall i like the angle that this is a place for t players that may not have an opportunity on say a tier one roster because it's just been kind of weird overall the lack of of danish talent that has been rising up the lack of i feel like we there was a huge influx of danish in-game leaders and a huge lineage that was passed on and we had so many great names come from there and i feel like that's just not happening as much in fact when i made my top 24 of the year i don't think i really even put a single person in the top in in like for the first half of the year that was danish so i feel like there needs to, there should be more opportunities even though the danes were on top for such a long time i still feel like they should be doing better than they are right now and this is a great place for them not only to to uh just maybe punch up and do something with this rocker roster but it could just kind of be an incubation space for a player like say say kragen does start doing better maybe this is like the roster that he's going to get those opportunities on so a lot of a lot of reasons to be happy and positive about gaming gladiators here i don't know if we're going to be necessarily seeing them punch up into like the top 20 like I, I would be I'd be pretty happy if I even see them make it to the major, for example, and do what they did last time. But who knows? But overall, I mean, I like seeing big orgs get into the space in general. Right. Let's go to the bad point. So what's your bad point, King T? Right. So it's a bit of a weird time to make this my bad point. I love it. Uh, go for it. I'm, I'm fully aware of that, but I genuinely want to talk about it because something that keeps coming up in my daily conversations about Counter-Strike. And I essentially need to rag on Wonderful a bit. Because as I said, this is the worst time to do this. He has had one of his best events at EWC, uh, put up a near MVP level performance, Wonderful. But over the course of 2024, he has been demonstrably with numbers, but also to the eye, the most inconsistent AWPer in the top teams. And it's not even close. This man has had as many uh, maps with a rating below 0.9 as he has over like 1.3 wow okay. he has been that extreme in his variety um so i just wanted to point that out i also think it's important to note that navi themselves have this massive boon they have the best igl coach combo probably in the scene in terms of developing uh, game plans uh, util sets and training them into those their players, because you see everyone's able to actually execute at this really high level. But what they've lacked so desperately is firepower. And often the focus is, oh, well, JL kind of has to form from these spots in bit. We really need more out of bit. And I feel like Wonderful in the general population gets too much of a pass, uh, considering he is capable of being not just bad, but horrific in so many of these big maps. It's, uh, it's a problem that they need to resolve if they want to be consistently considered top and not have every single one of their event wins just be looked at as another fluke because, hey, this one time, the firepower got itself together. But aside from that, looking pretty and potentially making playoffs isn't enough to be considered really the number one team in the world. Wonderful is just... The problem with Wonderful is that he passes the eye test in terms of how rapidly this dude flicks his mouse but in terms of positioning himself to have impact he is pretty consistently poor at it in terms of just binding fights uh, i feel like one of the reasons that 
when he first joined Spirit in the set of Dexter that they liked him so much is that he got out of the way. He was like the polar opposite of Dexter as a personality. He would just listen to the strategy that Chopper calls. He would throw the nades that they need him to. And he would just be a turret in the back lines just holding for any CT that decides to peek through and execute that Spirit was throwing. And I feel like he... Even he kind of had a resurgence when he played with Sprout, started taking a little bit more initiative, but now he's kind of regressed back to sort of what he did with Spirit again, where he's not calling his own number nearly enough, and especially not on T sides. I don't feel like anything that he's doing. It, I don't. I don't know if they're necessarily. They're probably not designing anything for him on the T side, but I don't think many teams in general design too much other than maybe say an opening pick for their operas on the T side right now. So I don't really. You're right. This is a really bad time to say this because if you took purely what he did at EWC, it's like, what are you even talking about? But if you just chop off that event, which was a huge aberration given that it was practically speaking his best event of the year, then it's, it's yeah, it's been highs, really some decent highs, but some pretty low lows too. Like, he, yeah, like streakiness is definitely a concern for him. And I feel like it's like... I, I pitted Brokey against Torzy earlier in the year, and that kind of blew up for me. But again, I kind of do the same thing. It's like, at least with Torzy, I just know what I'm getting day in, day out. With with Halzerk, I kind of know what I'm getting. I feel like Wonderful has so much more untapped potential, and it's about putting it to the right use, or putting it in the right spaces, or just even just taking a fight. Like, like instead of being the last man alive and trying to bail your team out of something, or just saving... He's he's just not he's not imposing himself nearly as much in the mid round as he probably could, and that's something where they definitely need to find more ways and opportunities for him to do that. Um, I think his rifle's okay, but I would, honest to God, probably take Nika Dawes's rifle over Wonderfuls. So that's probably not the best sign either. And uh, overall, I, I don't I just for for whatever for whatever reason it, it's it's very odd that. Blade hasn't found... I, I guess, you know what, now that I think about it, maybe it's not odd that Blade hasn't figured out how to use Wonderful perfectly, because he's so used to having somebody that was so autonomous, such as Simple, that he didn't really have to worry about that, and he was constructing more so a game plan for the Riflers and the Space Takers on his team. Yeah, there's a few things. I'll pick up on some of the things you guys said to say. So first of all, I actually agree that even though it looks like the timing's the worst King T, basically you've figured out the meta now of how I do it, which is I don't think up a contrarian take. I've told I've told everyone this before. It's why, why I did that infamous Fallen tweet. Do you know the real reason people were upset about that Fallen tweet? A lot of people don't know the context. It's because if you ever go and look it up, I tweeted it like right after he like carried a game at a major as like a fucking 30-year-old boomer or something mental. Like, because at, like you're doing now, I actually think the real brave take is when everyone's going, this guy's amazing because he just had a glow up, is to go, actually, I've got to say, I think he's overrated and not that good, and here's the reason why. And essentially, look, it's not going to play well, unless you want to have, like, controversy and discussion, blah, 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 etc. But I do think, essentially, it's the ultimate courage to say, like, I actually don't think that person's that good. In the same way as to say, you think the reflux not that good. You just won the fucking event. Obviously, people are going to rag on you and go, you win you you just won the event. And obviously, this particular event, I actually think is a perfect example, though, King T. Because on the one hand, nobody said this, because nowadays everyone does value the final a lot. If you look at stats, this guy... Uh, after the bit Nico conversation, is the most obvious next MVP of the tournament. He had amazing numbers for the whole event, but I'll tell you what, he didn't do a whole lot in that final. And in fact, you know that other final, everyone brags, hey, they've made two finals now, Thorin. He did fuck all in that spirit final too. So I think actually, even his big performances show what King T's saying. Because think about this, when I give you this framing, I think even a moron will see that they've actually looked at wonderful the wrong way. Which is, I'll give two parts. So one, I'll actually defend Maniac. Maniac always says the opposite. He thinks wonderful is underrated. I actually know what he means by that, because I've just talked to Maniac enough, I know how he thinks about CS. He means not in the sense that wonderful's anywhere near Modesty's level. What he means is if you look how Na'Vi plays, bro, they would never make a single final without Wonderful. Like, he's like the backbone of their system. In fact, I do think in some ways to play into what Maui said, I do think Blade actually probably somewhat likes the way he plays. He plays just a very boring, simplistic, predictable style. But I'll tell you what, I'll bet you're able to fucking game plan around that. If you're Lexi B, you know exactly where this guy's going to be, you know what angle he's watching, you know what he's doing. You don't know that, by the way, with a Dexter, with a Modesty, with a... You have no idea. I also agree with that final point there. So here's the 
the point I would make. If you agree with Maniac, as I would, that the best player on Na'Vi is wonderful, well, then explain this to me, guys, fans of majors not being flukes. By the, if, if these tournaments aren't flukes, well, then you actually have to say, you would on placing anyway, that Na'Vi's the team of the year so far. So let's just follow the logic. If wonderful is the best player using the best gun on the, be on the best team of the year, why does not a single human being have him in their top five players of the world? Du, 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 du. Right, have you th finished thinking out? Because you know he's not actually that sick. You know that no matter what the stats tell you, this guy isn't actually enough of a beast. It's why I've always said, I'll give it a contrast point again, because he just won this event. I always thought that actually that shows to me that, Sp that Spirit had no fucking clue what they were talking about with Dexter. Because they did seem to like Wonderful more. And I remember watching him going... Wonderful's pretty good, but he's just the worst version of Dexter without the autonomy. Like, the autonomy they don't like is what I like about Dexter. I like the idea he calls his own number because he's going to hit a home run, you dickhead. Get out of his way, you guy who doesn't know how the orb works. Let him call his number and he will get kills, and he has proven he will do that. I think that's actually the re I agree with what you said as well, Maui. If you've had simple... The reason Simple's entire career is the whole scene telling him, be less toxic, be less selfish, is because he's the ultimate alpha male, isn't he? He's the guy who's always calling his... He doesn't, the joke about him is he doesn't even know he has the green light. He wasn't even aware there was a light system. He's just taking every shot he wants. <laughs> it's actually one of the reasons why he's probably not in the team right now, because everyone knows, like, essentially... He's like fucking Thanos. Like the whole universe changes when this guy comes in your team. Like you better be prepared for it. You can't just go, hey, Simple, we're just going to integrate. You're just going to like call these players. Like he doesn't, he's Peyton Manning. He calls his own players, motherfucker. In fact, he turns off the mic before the shot clock ends, you know, like. So I think the problem you have there, I agree, Maui, is when you've had the ultimate agency opera, it's going to be hard to take an opera because I'm going to say this as well. I'm going to psychologically speculate. I don't think it's the case that Wonderful is from the Shiro James school of like passive slash really defensive orping. I think they do that because that is how they think CS should be played. I think if you watch how Wonderful plays, I do think he either thinks he can't call his own number in this analogy, Maui, and he has to like stick to the system, or I actually think he sometimes just doesn't have the confidence to. If you ever read his interviews, he doesn't come off as arrogant at all. In fact, the opposite. He has been overly self-effacing, in my opinion. If you look at his interviews about the idea he could never be in Na'Vi because he have Simple and Modesty, or some of the other things he said, he actually seems incredibly humble as a player. And I have to say, if I want him to, to be the player he probably could be, I'd want to pump that up a bit. It's a bit like the Zewu thing. Let me get in this with a fucking this guy in a room. I'll, I'll have him coming out being the most egotistical cunt of all time. I want that. I want him to be a bit spicier. Because I do think this guy could actually be better. I think he's got like a fifth gear he doesn't kick into that often now. Because in, in my opinion, as my classic way of saying it this guy's problem is he lets the game come to him but that's not what the greatest players in the world do the greatest players in the world go look at what like donk monacy they make the game come to them they force the game their way whether they're playing well or not whether they're getting the gun or not whether the other team's awesome or not that's what makes them the greatest players the transcendent players and then i'll just say finally the one problem i also have is this which is when you look at his stats and you look at just the eye test of like his highlight rounds, you will see this guy could be like the fifth best player in the world. But I do think this, like how he works in Na'Vi and how he seems to make his decisions, that will actually hold him back. He actually reminds me, by the way, in that sense of Device back in the day, where I always told people, like, by the way, Device actually, Device at this point has gotten the get right rap, where because you compare Device to Simple and you compare get right to Forest, people start talking like they don't have skills and that they're a five. No, no, I'm saying if Forest is a 10 out of 10, get right was just a nine out of 10. You know what I mean? So he, let's not pretend Device isn't insanely skilled at CS. He just wasn't simple and never tried to play that way. But you saw the difference between Device who was like second guessing himself and Device who was just locked in. It was the same player skill-wise, but there's a massive difference in terms of impact. So, no, I actually agree. I think what's weird is, if you want to look at how Na'Vi's constructed, I actually think Wonderful doesn't get enough props. I think people do over-focus on big global performances from JL and fucking Bit for obvious reasons, or they just focus on hating Emma. But, so I actually do think Wonderful's <laughs> the best player on the team, but spoiler, this all loops back. This is why I actually don't think Na'Vi's the true number one. Like, if you look at how we evaluate number ones, we do do it on placings. So on placings, they have to be number one. But if you're talking spiritually, like if you watch the game, Game. essentially here's the question if I put a gun to your head and said which team do you want to represent you in a match and if you lose you die I don't think any of you motherfuckers <laughs> are picking Na'Vi including Na'Vi players there you go how about that <laughs> you know what Spirit might not have won I think I'll take Spirit off <laughs> like you know what I mean or fucking Vitality I'll take them over this Na'Vi squad boys
Right. Yeah. Are we going on? I think Any this, more points? Yeah. This. This. Uh, well. This. This. I think it leads into my my bad. Point. All right. Um. So yeah. But I mean, I wanted to talk about Navi also. I feel like we've. Uh, it's. It's just that uh, in all the the talk about, you know, who's the best and everything like that, and and in terms of trying to really place them in terms of like the flu conversation, everything like that. Like I think all of these have kind of sort of muddied what's what we're really witnessing here, which is a team that is just. That is just flat out. I'm not gonna. I wouldn't even say. Yeah, that that they're to me the world number one. I'm gonna put them in a power rankings as my number one team. But this is this to me is the most elite T side that I have seen since probably Prime Astralis. I I feel like what we're seeing in terms of what they're able to conjure on their T side is just flat out. It it is it is seriously like like two brilliant minds that have come together and made a ragtag group of people again and like like we can go back to the same discussion about about what we said about you about wonderful that he's not a top five player that you wouldn't say JL is a top five player and yet they to me have the best T side in the world and they have the best T side that I've seen from any real team since maybe Prime Astralis maybe if I want to be generous I could even say the Navi before them back in 2021 that won the the Stockholm Major but that that was working with Prime Bit Electron and simple and so it's a little bit of a different a difference in terms of firepower in that conversation and so i just wanted to put this out there that i feel like it's almost almost not i, I just feel like when i was i don't know what reading reading twitter and like just kind of post games and and e like the desk and everything like that like this is this is an unprecedentedly great t side and the bad point is just simply i don't think it gets talked enough about enough and i feel like it's it's approaching the point now where with this roster the amount of of credit that i need to give blade is already like it's it was kind of like a 1a 1b between him and zonic but now i'm seeing with a completely different roster what blade is able to accomplish with individual players who are inconsistent didn't even weren't even necessarily superstars on their own teams and now he's put together a system that to me is the best t side in tier one counter-strike and, and when i watch these navi games now it's not really even much of much about like like who's gonna pop off today it's can you on your ct side get six rounds can you get six rounds on practically every map against navi's t side or better because they're always going to have such well drilled game plans and the only weird thing is like yeah, they can kind of like fall apart on one map, but then they just come back with like insane T sides. Like the one, I, I don't know what's going on with this Navi team, but I, the amount of times I see them just lose a map really badly, like to, to Mouse in the semifinals here, 13 to 1, and then just kind of blow them out of the water again is just absurd. Like I don't, I don't know, but it's like the composure that this team finds between maps is insane. And I feel like a lot of it's predicated on the fact that do they have a good game plan or not going into the map? And so again, like I just want to give a lot of credit to Alexi B, Blade because this this is just like we're seeing we're seeing one of the best t sides of all time yeah so i think it was last year at some point when they started assembling this this lineup blade had an interview where he referred to a master plan and i remember at the time referencing it rather disparagingly because i was watching a team that looked like they really didn't have one uh, they were just kind of sticking it out making things work and slowly over the course of this sort of duration it's like 12 months he has basically shown that he did all along have one hell of a master plan i was completely wrong uh, these t sides have been glorious and i'm gonna be honest that grand final it did feel like uh, after ancient where g2 is as we can tell it's the only map they figured out after that map it was like watching a team playing counter-strike versus puggers and like even if g2 were calling loose they shouldn't be showed up to that extent it was crazy the diff between the t sides Navi have, yeah, impressed me with util sets, mid rounds, uh, honestly, execs straight out of spawn. Like, even when they throw those in, they're so well crafted, it doesn't matter. Even the one on Nuke that got highlighted by HLTV, which was one I loved in game when we watched on the live, uh, on the live stream, it was so well done just because of the delay on the actual exec, not making it an instant out of spawn um, execution, and then to execute it so cleanly was just beautiful um, i think addressing the goat poach the goat coach point very importantly i think this has been the part that separated maybe carrigan and glaive it does matter how many rosters you've actually built something glorious with having one five-man combo that worked once sure even over the course of four majors doesn't impress me as much as making it work over and over again with completely different lineups completely different igls in this case of the coach conversation for me that's a far more compelling argument 
so no, I do think Blade is definitely not just in the conversation. He might have just taken another point. If Zonic can't ever make this Falcons project work, we might come to the end of the year and think their roles, they kind of switched in the ranking. Uh, but what matters to me is, yeah, if we can keep getting Na'Vi, they don't even have to play at this level. They don't have to win the events. They just need to play well enough with the individuals, like just hitting their shots to make it out of groups, because that's been their issue this year. So when they're not making a grand final, they're just stuck in the group stage, which is outrageous for a team who should be contending for the highest level and showing us some of the best Counter-Strike we see. So that's all I want to see. I want to see them actually find some consistency out of bit, JL, the rifle core in, as a trio, and get them out of groups, just so I can see more of it in best of three play on the big stages. Yeah, on that point you say there about contrasting it, like in the same way as we did the Clay of Carrigan contrast by one obviously took a different route to success. No, I actually think what's funny is until CS2, people would have said, well, obviously Zonic's got it sealed, doesn't he? He's got the four majors with the Strats, and then he went with a different squad. Yes, two of the players, but they weren't his main stars. And he went with the Zewu Vitality and won a different major. But notice in those two different sets of teams, he had Zewu and Device. Like, spoiler, they're in the top five competition yeah. all time in that game. If you look at Blade, look, first major, I'm with you. He had Simple, the GOAT. This major, we just had a conversation about fucking Wonderful, who's probably the best player in their team. Like, he's not even top five now in CS, never mind all time. Like, so that conversation already is mental because, like, just look at what, like, Zonic has never been able to do it when he's, by the way, I don't know almost anyone who has. Even if you take, like, my, the other one I often put in the conversation was obviously Zeus from back in the day with Liquid and that. Bro, he still had, like, Prime Elise, he had fucking Cold Zero. Like, in general, you notice the great coaches have the best players. So I think what Blade is doing right now, I agree with you. I know people think, funnily enough, that we're doing it as, like, a backhanded compliment because we don't want to compliment the players. So we're just going, must be Blade. And I like to speak. No, no, that's actually just knowing the game. That's why Maui's point about how they characterize the team is key. Essentially, they're not players in that sense. But, like, the stars of Na'Vi are the coach of the IGL. It's just obvious. So I think the craziest thing about this squad is you go down, like I just did there, with the Zonic comparison. And you just realize, bro, these guys are underrated. Because with Glit, with Blade, as of right now, he's like the best CS2 coach. We can have that conversation. It's obvious. Like, just look at the results he's had. By the way, his team's nearly always in playoffs too. Then in terms of Alexi B, like... Think about this. I used to make this point about Carrigan in this, like, 2022 on era of phases. That wasn't when he had Nico and Guardian still near peak form, right? He had, like emerging Rops who was starting to be like, you know, like the eighth best player in the world. Then he had like, what, twists when he would be sort of like, I don't know, 14th best player. You know, he'd have like Brokey where, yeah, he could have some times where he'd be his sixth best player, but he never had that like number one contender, right? It's even worse in the Snarvy team, boys. Think about this. I always say, aside from IGL, and by the way, this is why I always said IGL. Obviously, you want to have stars, right? If you want to win in CS. So first things first, everyone knows Star Opera, right? His star opera is wonderful. Does anyone even have wonderful top three op in the world? I don't know a single person where that's the day. No. Like, I think he... He's still I think, fighting for top five. Yeah, I think a lot of people, yeah, by yeah. the way, think that, like, despite this result, I think a lot of people still have him sort of jostling with Torshi and people like that, don't they? Isn't that the sort of level most people have this guy dialed in for? Like, the, everyone, I think, would say there's a very clear difference between Monacy, Zewu, and this. And by the way, the joke is Zewu doesn't even use the gun half the time. But I tell you what, the half the time he does, he looks a lot better than wonderful and Torshi and some of the other guys. So there's no star op. Opa, then you right. If I don't have a star opera, look at Nico's career. I've got to have a star rifler. Uh, guys, can someone explain to me who the star rifler on Navi is? And by the way, anyone who goes bit, shut the fuck up or watch the game. <laughs> like it's not even vaguely plausible. <laughs> it's like what's crazy about bit is I even looked this up. He's had two events. He did this at guys in the whole of CS2. <laughs> like out of ten events, he had two where he glowed up. Well, spoiler: when someone eighty percent of the time doesn't do something, I'd say they're not the guy you are telling me they are. Like that's just basic maths for you there. That you can take that to the bank. Then consider this. So I. I don't have a star opera. I don't particularly have like a star aggressive rifler. We well, you know what, at least I've got like GL. He's a bit of a lurker. Win's got so I've got a does anyone think GL's the best lurker in the world? What are we talking about? And then lastly, here's one of those times where usually I think that opening kill stat on HL TV gets abused because people don't realize it doesn't really say what you think it does. It just says who had the first kill. So the problem is, actually, you're not necessarily the entry because you got the first kill. I mean, famously, the example who always abused this was Blame F. Blame F had times where his first kill rate was decent in terms of usage because essentially, Maui, he did just rush after all the ecos. So on every eco, he would get the first kill. 
and it would make the number. And I saw certain people, I'm shouting you out, Nero, they accidentally implied that he couldn't be a passive player as a result of that. Even though it's like, look, bro, I'm a, a blame the defender. One thing we don't do is waste our time starting on the hill of he's not passive. Like, that's just a waste of everyone's time, isn't it, you idiot? So what I'll say is this. If you look that up for Na'Vi in 2024, go to opening kill, side. what you are going to see immediately, and people like Maui use these stats, but you'll be able to confirm this. Bro, every team normally works this way, Maui. You have two players whose job is to eat the shit sandwich. They're the ones who are usually 25% opening. Bro, look in this team. So obviously, Wonderful is a bit passive because of the Orpa, right? They have four players who are 20 plus percent opening kill attempts. What that actually implies is this isn't a team of stars. This is a fucking squad. This is a system. This is everything from the coach and IGL on down because that even infers to me, Maui. They don't even have a normal system that normal teams do. They don't have like a Yikenda who like waits for you to go in first and he comes in and clear. They, they're just doing whatever works on what that map is. What that I imagine they're even switching up the system and if someone's not working on this game, you rotate someone else. This actually infers like anyone getting lost in the source of a bit over performance or GL carrying a series you're missing what is actually brilliant about Na'Vi that's what allows them to win but actually I always think it's on the other end of the system that I'm impressed what impresses me with Na'Vi is the fucking floor of this team I look at their roster and I'm like mate even right now when they've won these massive events I would take like four or five different rosters over this one if I have to start fresh and continue on in CS2 but I'll tell you what they're competing with all those teams I'm talking about. They're making the semis and the quarters and the final. So I think absolutely, this is like one of the areas where if you focus too much on the fluke thing or the players who are overrated, it'll sound like you're a hater. I fucking actually low-key love this team because of Alexi being played. Like, But here's yeah. the obvious reason why I have to, why I agree this has to be a bad also, is because that's why people trying to over-defend Na'Vi are missing the point. Which is, bro, if you had the exact same team but were allowed to change one player, couldn't we make this team actually number one? You know what I mean? If I can either bring in a better all or a better star, bro, then we would have a truly all time. That that could be one of the teams for the ages because the way they play CS plus having the firepower would be really something special in my opinion. I also think, by the way, in CS2, a lot of teams, even the best teams, I always say this about Vitality, look like a group of individuals shooting people. This is a real team. This is actually a real team where I don't think that when you open up Glaive, the fucking Blade dossier, it says Iplorum 6. It actually says real strats there. And he clearly has done the fucking homework, you know. I'd love to believe it. It's just like, you know, inside it, it's just like, get two cabbages and... Uh, parsley, you know, that would be genius too if it just said all that shit. <laughs> Come on, any, anything more, boys? It, it's, yeah. it's, I mean, the thing about, that's so to me characteristic. If you have to, if you if you did the nameplate test, like take off the nameplates and watched how Navi's played their T sides, I don't think I see a single team on T side shoot CTs more in the side of the head because of the misdirection yes. that they created in the middle of the round or because they just made the CTs uncomfortable and try to just make a desperation play there there's so many times where they take map control create an uncomfortable position for the CTs and then the CTs just had to have to do something that's stupid and I feel like one thing that actually really hurt G2 in those grand finals is that they they got punished a couple times and then they just stopped doing anything. I, I feel like they actually started clamming up against Navi because they were just out positioned so many times. And I feel like that's the position that so many teams find themselves in. And it's also why this team has a high, uh, I mean, a really low floor, though. It's a really low floor because so much of their game plan is predicated not on just winning crazy fights. It's on creating really awkward positions for their opponents that, they're, that the opponents just make a mistake. Like, you never never see opponents look as dumb as they do unless they're playing Navi. That's that's what's so impressive about the game plans that LXEB and Blade have conjured. And and for my money, if you actually just take Blade off of this team, I I we'll see what LXEB could do, but I feel like you put Blade on any other team and they're competing for number 1 in the world within 3 months. I think he would figure them out very quickly and understand all the ways that he could possibly improve them and if and and the thing is that's funny it's like uh, again i'm kind of remarking on the lack of roster strength here if you took him and put him on like any other top 10 team in the world i don't see why that team would probably not just be in Navi's position today with an HLTV ranking number one, because like you look at almost all these teams with the exception of maybe like say complexity, or we really go down the line, like heroic and all these other teams in the top eight, why couldn't they do exactly what they're doing if they had blade at the coach? 
Oh, yeah, by the way, a couple of other things to throw in there. Another thing as well that we're all just taking for granted is, bro, this is an international lineup. Remember the lesson we all agreed with fucking Apex from when he won the Blast Paris Major, which is actually the reason, it's not just because you have Carrigan and Fears. Typically, you have to play a bit more up-tempo when you have like five different nationalities or something. Mark it. This guy's working on that. And then he, he this team, again, if you took the nameplates off, Matt, well, you could believe this was some Ukrainian team played was I gelling himself 10 years ago. It's like the structure <laughs> is mental how he keeps it all together. And remember... We all know people like him who have destroyed confidence and what they do. But I tell you what, they work in the system somehow in spite of the fucking stats. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? And also, by the way, I think that that's why the whole thing of getting over-focusing on the rating, this last event proves it. Because, bro, when I watched that final, I was like, this is just an Alexi B masterclass, mate. He is just fucking tooling these guys. I can tell Rage how he was just... Like making like, oh, by the way, perfect team to do it against because obviously it was a brand new roster, wasn't it? Like G2 yeah. was in the fucking hell in that game. That was nightmare mode trying to play <laughs> CT side against those Alexi B T, -T sides. It was wild. Yeah, right, let's move. Yeah, go on. Do, sorry, I just have a quick point on the, uh, go for the it. Navi team conversation. Um, it's kind of where we started, but it's where I want to finish as well quickly. Every time I talk about making changes in this team, there is someone who'll defend the player in some okay. crazy way and it's getting <laughs> yeah. on my nerves okay like, it doesn't matter how inconsistent or poor the player's been like how many shots they miss there is someone willing to die on their sword for this for these individuals and i do not understand why <laughs> like maybe jl you know he's got that himbo thing going on but like everyone else <laughs> why does anyone give a crap like come on and make the team elite again i know yeah yeah no th this is the team where it's like it, if anything the only people that are irreplaceable are the igl and coach and that's yes. kind of yeah wrapping the whole discussion yes. up about it it's like you could replace like next tournament it's going to be a different mvp they had jl at the major yeah. they had bit at this one at the next one it'll be wonderful and then it, f fuck it next one it's ema i don't even care anymore yes. i don't even care Entirely it's possible. Emo that yeah. yeah oh by the way that's even an angle i didn't thought to say as well when i pointed out that Karen and one of the reasons he's like a go IGL is he was able to win basically almost everything but without like a superstar player yeah but he did still have like three or four players that were going to be in the top 20 bro yeah. I actually think if Na'Vi wins no more tournaments there'll be like one or two max players from Na'Vi that are getting in this top 20 like even I, even with the whole EVP thing bro they don't get them that often like I actually think people don't realize like it's gonna be basically wonderful plus I don't know, maybe bit if he does it again. You know, I don't even know at this point. I don't even know. Like, it'll be a lot less than you realize, guys. So also, if yeah, they end up being be team like of the year. 20 to 15, they won't even be that high up. No, yeah, they, like, also, they won't be. Like, no one will be top five. No one will be top five. Yeah. No way. Oh, JL no, will have no, that, no, like, no. rain style. You know, he has the major MVP. That he has be, to be in here. Yes. But, like... Not even then, he probably has to go off at Cologne or something, you know, or do something at the next major as well. Mm. Right, my bad point is also very on brand, if you know the things that annoy me in esports. It's about this EWC. It is simply this, that Nico didn't get to win EWC. Because, bro, that was the best tournament Nico has played in CS2. In fact, in the final... I've always said, I always said when we were watching this, right, obviously G2 did win map one, even though they made a bit of a dog's dinner of it. By the way, Lexi B called great on that map too. Then on the second map, Nuke, on CT side, they were fragging out, they were looking good, but then Lexi B did loads of good fucking calls and ground the back in with 6-6. Six, six. Then after that, the problem was, if you don't know, they didn't win a T round and then they just got absolutely murked when they were on the last map. If you watch that tournament, not only was Nico playing insane in the rest of the tournament, but for that one and a half opening maps of the final, he was really good. If you go watch, he was just really good. Like, he's fragging on CT Nuke. He's fragging on both sides of the opening map, Ancient. Like, this guy actually did enough to be not only the champion of this tournament, but he would have been the MVP. And you know the saddest thing of all? If I'm going to talk shit on everyone in G2 when Monacy carries and they don't let him win, well, you know what? Monacy wasn't great in this final. Monacy, actually, for his normal level, was actually under the weather. In fact, here's the worst thing. Think about the players that you want in G2 if you want them to win. You want it to be Monacy's the best player in the world, Nico's really good, and then the dream, it was happening up until this final, Hunter is back in CS Go form. Well, in the final, Monacy ended up minus seven and was nowhere near his form. Hunter just shit the bed completely, despite he'd, have, he'd had a great run until that point. He was minus 25. Nico still played pretty well, and he just could not have won this match. So I actually think what's brutal is, much like a lot of his career, he's ended up in a scenario where it didn't matter how well he played, he just couldn't win this event, apparently. So I just feel bad for the guy because I think of all the fucking scuffed lineups, probably not that many expectations now to win. I actually think the way he played at this tournament was dope. He played really fucking well. Yeah, he had an outstanding tournament. Like this wasn't just until the grand final. The like, grand final put a damper on his actual like stats just for the last map. But overall, it would have been a standout performance. Like 
not even close for the rest of the year. I think yes. for the rest of the year he's been solid, but compared to his own standard, a little bit underwhelming. Yep. But at this event, he was beyond even his standard. He was sensational. And you're right, Ancient, he played well. The first half of Nuke, yeah, still looks solid. Uh, but then after that, he didn't really find anything. The team fell apart. They capitulated on map three. Enough said. But no, the rest of the tournament, the way he played, I think especially against, yeah, against Virtus Pro, uh, both him and Hunter also had an outstanding dust too. But it was across both maps. It was Nico basically took them to school. It's like, who are these Russian kids you've put up against me? Like a lot of these guys don't have anywhere near the pedigree to be on my server. And he absolutely destroyed them. So no, he played amazing. And to the fact that this is this is the event they don't manage to actually like fluke the win, kind of. Like, you know, G2 had a couple event wins, like Dallas. Nonsense. But Monacy played outstanding. They rewarded it. They got it over the line. In this case, yeah, they could have they could have held his hand a little. They could have helped him just over the finish line, just when they needed a little bit more. It's a shame. And by the way, before anyone says, like, yeah, but it's up to Nico to perform. To be fair, IGL is the star player from Virtus Pro six years ago. I'm going to keep saying that like a prick until he actually does something, mate. Because, I, by the way, yes, I, yes. I didn't I didn't do it for this episode, Maui. But I really did think about making, like, my ugly point that G2 did so well. Because if you watch that tournament, I don't know what you think Snacks did. Like, bro, they were just shooting people with guns. Like, Nothing. I could have made a whole I thing know. about it, but I've decided for now to hold it because here's the thing. I actually think that take will get way spicier after this next event. I think you'll, he will be exposed to it because the, the joke of that event is if he actually even played slightly good, they probably did win this event. Like, so whatever. It's a whatever in it. I have too much to say about that in later points. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do that. To... It's all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the bad point overall that this is an, a, basically just a wasted performance from Nico it's it's pitiful i mean for for a guy that's been getting ragged on for the entirety of cs2 that yep. he himself admitted that he was having a difficult transition once the game switched over and now he puts up this monstrous performance i i feel like it's it's just so it's so disappointing because for whatever freaking reason like so many fans were calling for nico's head be and i was like i was like what are we watching are we watching the same thing because because a downturn for nico very briefly earlier this year was like nico was was what putting up a um a 1.1 rating at a tournament and people were like he's not a star like it's like he's not one of the best it's like he's still pretty clearly one of the best five riflers in the game and at ewc he was the best rifler he was he was like i mean yeah, you can say Bit or whatever, but I feel like Bit was, in a way, a product of the system that he was in, and he was rewarded because of it, whereas Nico was just making Herculean efforts in really tough moments mechanically to find kills that G2 had no business getting, and still G2 would lose the rounds. Like, there was, it was like in Inferno early on, it was like Nico would get a Deagle yep. kill, they'd get a nade kill, and it's like a 5v3, but then Hunter's just... Hunter's just playing with his dick. Like, he's just doing nothing. Like, he's just literally, he's, he's right, he's behind a smoke, and he's just, like, quick switching between a smoke grenade and a 5-7. It's like, dude, you, like, you need to shoot them, too. You, your cousin can't do everything, man. It was, I mean, it was just, it was just pitiful. It was um one of the worst moments for him overall, and that's why it's so difficult with G2 and these narratives that we have for them, because I think, like, fans... We've been we've been very critical of G2 for many different reasons. Uh, for me, it's been Taz lately. Before that, I mean, we were kind of down on Hooksy here and there. But it's it's kind of because we want to see Nico succeed because he's been the greatest rifler if in terms of consistency and overall peaks for the last eight years of this game. And he's not been rewarded with a major trophy. He's he's only been rewarded with a single Cato, a single Cologne. And practically a Blast World Finals beyond that. And and it's just it's just not enough. It's just not enough for what he's able to do. And the fact that after a player break for a brand new roster, he's able to put together his best CS2 performance. Like, are you kidding me? Like, it, it, if anything, he's supposed to be like those FaZe Clan like narrative. He's supposed to invoke those FaZe Clan narratives we have, which are that they're not going to get out of bed unless it's a major. That should kind of be the story of Nico, that he's like a playoff warrior and basically just kind of coasting through group stages. But he still gives it absolutely everything in these moments. And I... And I, I in terms of his gameplay, I just I love it to death, and I I don't I wish I wish that this could have been rewarded with something and an MVP. But at the end of the day, I guess for my narrative's sake, 
uh, I'm not I'm not sold on this G2 roster. So I'm, I'm kind of glad By the way, that I'm, I can be right there. Also, imagine being equal. You're in blazing form. You go to the final. You get Na'Vi. By the way, on paper, that's about the best you could hope for in the final. Like, should have been a mouse or a phase or a, if you, depending on the bracket, it could have been Spirit or Vitality, right? Think about this. And then what happens in the final that makes you lose? Uh, GL does a 1.37 rating and Bit does a 1.31. Can I get a fucking break? Like, at the same time, you mean when Wonderful, their best player, has a bad series? Two other people post, like, fucking donk numbers against me. Like, well, gee, I guess I'm just not allowed to win because I agree with you, Maui. Even with that Cologne and Kadavitsi, Nico's trophy cabinet is fucking ass. It's all the, like low level tier one events that no one like it's all the ones people would rather not win you know what I mean like he essentially here's the joke Nico wishes he could take his whole trophy cabinet except Katowice and Cologne and have some sort of a trade up contract and he combines them all together and it makes two more Katowice's he would take that tomorrow guys he would take the epicenter plus blast pro series plus starlight you know and crunch them all together yeah. and then he just gets like one Katowice XX year or something you know like he'd take that in an instant guy Nice, come on. <laughs> right, are we going on to the ugly point now, King T? I think, yeah. I think he yeah. has more, oh, really quick, I think he has more, I mean, I, I gotta I gotta look at the numbers, but on the HLTV, like, trophy cabinet, in terms I would of guess he has, like, 15 or something, he doesn't have many trophies, he doesn't have that many. Yeah, but, but he has, like, in terms of MVP medals plus top 20s, I think that actually probably oh, be beats enormous. his total. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it, it's, it's an insane amount. I think he has, like, seven top 20s and like and he has eight mvps yeah there you go that up. so it's like it's it's oh no that's the one to look up what you should look up yeah you're right is does he have more of those combined than trophies because it's got to be close it's got to be close yeah. i think it's the exact same really it's 15 really? yeah there you go. 15 to 15 i mean that's crazy i mean i also but by the way if you're counting it the opener of the year trophy is also on that sliding bar so i mean yeah okay. dude, I mean. all right right king t what is your ugly point Right, so I feel like the last time I was on here, for one of my points, I ragged on NA. And I'm going to do it again because it's really fun. <laughs> okay, wow. Well, that's uh, a shock, okay. <laughs> I, I love doing it. It's yeah, I know. It's so you know. <laughs> So basically, NA's in a really dire state where they can produce rosters that can play uh, at sort of a tier one, like more, most of them at tier 1.5 sort of level, um, if they import at least 40% of the roster. Um, and that's a kind of shocking state to be in. Liquids no longer count as North American that. in the uh, HLTV rankings. Neither do Wildcard, another team who are about to overtake M80 probably in the world rankings. Um, these rosters have to go and bring players in. And it's kind of shocking. I got it when it was sort of these um, more difficult cerebral roles like IGL. It was okay. Like brought in foreign coaches. Then it was Orpers. And that was just oh, as many players as you can because... Wildcard brought in an Orpa and just a rifler because oh, screw it. There just isn't enough talent in the region. No one's taking the game seriously enough. Two Swedes playing on 100 ping can just win the latest trophy we had, like available, the NA Revival Series. Yeah, those two Swedes on Wildcard were playing on over 100 ping. They're still in Sweden. They might have arrived now, but back then they hadn't. So I think it's a really shocking state to be in. Uh, it keeps getting worse every time I come on the show. I think that's the really disappointing part. And if you have NA talents left, like Twists, like Elige, you have to pair them up with Europeans for them to have a chance to go win silverware. So that's kind of my ugly point. There's not just terrible teams anymore, but they have to be rescued by Europeans. <laughs> I, I mean, the state of NA at this point is like... The, 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 the problem... I don't know. The problem is like there's just... For whatever reason, you look at FPL in Europe and you're like, you're watching ROPS play, you're watching BIT play, and here, here are the people that are at the top of the NA FPL leaderboard. And this isn't really, I'm not taking a stab at any of these guys. I think that these guys, for, for what they're doing in NA, I'm glad that they're playing, I'm glad that they're competing and everything like that. You would have heard some of their names, but these are the top five people. You've got Wolf, Locke, Frankie, Junior, okay, people know his name, and Morrow. Like... People just don't know the talent right now. They aren't really nearly as strong as what they, we have in FP, uh, FPL Europe. And it's it's a shame that, for whatever reason also, we, we're really bad at cultivating oppers. I, I feel like there's this kind of cyclical uh, just, just progression that oppers find in NA where you just... You're you're made to develop the worst possible habits because the utility usage in North America is not as clean as it is in Europe. And so you get and I, I said this pretty early on with Junior and I, I, I mean, I think Junior 
can probably make a resurgence in the scene. He's still probably actually one of North America's best operas, as crazy as that is. It's a uh, you're if you want to take over and you want to win North American games and league matches and everything like that and win these cash cups, you're gonna just impose yourself in a way that is completely unsustainable versus European opposition. You're going to take way more repeaks. You're going to go for way... You're going to just hold these angles that are kind of obvious, but it's just that you're not getting flashed off of every single angle as you would be in Europe. And so you don't have to be nearly as creative because you can do the majority of the heavy lifting for yourself in the round in the first 30 seconds of it. Like, the amount of op opening kills for people in, like, NA, ECL is just so crazy high. And their success rate is so crazy high, too, because they just they just don't iron everything out there's so many people that are just getting cycled in cycled out so much more frequently it's kind of uh it's kind of amazing that someone like mobs came from the system and sort of just developed the right mindset for the game and just kind of went through it instead of having the results oriented style of thinking where he was like he was like i'm not finding enough success i'm gonna go like 10 times more aggressive i'm gonna go 10 times crazier and just dominate them with skill he actually developed in a, in a much more steady way for in my eyes like in the beginning he didn't like uh, for example he was a ramp player on nuke like he didn't have to just be the superstar rifler that just took duel after duel after duel he actually had good fundamental understanding of how to play the game on top of the fact that his skill was transcendent for the region yeah I, actually the interesting thing i'll take the angle you two did there right one that already in a way shows your point king t that Maui just did a whole soliloquy about Malbs, who's from Guatemala or Guatemala, as there's Alf, Gen Alpha. See, I'm trying okay, to go down, down okay. with them kids, you know, trying to, trying to work it in right. there, you know. It's any Workshop <laughs> that one. <laughs> anyway, anyway. My point is, he's not from America, is he? He's from Central America or whatever, you know. So, already, that's a we bad sign. That's we a bad sign that one of the few recently produced players wasn't even himself from any. So, no, here's the thing mm. I'll do. The reason why is if you just look historically, King T, He's actually right, Maui. It's actually the culture. They don't develop IGLs and AWPers. And if you notice, the reason I pushed that angle hard these last few years is, if you look at the greatest teams of all time, they pretty much all have the AWP and IGL. Like that, those end up being, they might not always be the star, but they're always like very important roles. You've got to have like Hall of Fame players there, otherwise it's really hard. Well, if you even look historically in NACS Go, bro, even the greatest teams of all time have exactly these problems. So if we go with Liquid, who on aggregate was the best NA team ever, just from sheer not tournaments placings, right? They famously had fucking Nitro, who was sort of like a pretty good IGL, but not the best. And then he was the opera. He was, but he was like the opera who did it the least possible and then just said, Naf, you can do it on a certain CT half if you want. So that wasn't it. They essentially worked without an opera at that point in time. Then if you go back to the Cloud9 team that won the major, the Boston major, right? Their IGL was Tarek, who I can tell you wasn't doing like fucking glaive strats. And the opera was Skadoodle, who famously, despite carrying the final, actually was not even that dope over the whole tournament. And then if you want a third team or a fourth team, you'd have to go the Cloud9 2015. That actually had a but not bad team. That was Skadoodle when he was good and you had Sean Gares. Sean Gares left CS at the end of like, what, 2016 or something? So you, you'll never have a team like that again. And then the last team's probably Evil Geniuses, right? Circus Bulgarian. And Stanislaw, funny enough, actually is still around. He's just not relevant, is he? Like, so if you look at it, right, you haven't got these pieces. And Yinbiski never did have, as I've just pointed out. So one of the biggest problems is, think about the all-time leaders in North America. And you're going with names like Nitro, Daps, Stanislaw, Sean, get none of them around. I mean, I know Stanislaw technically is, but no one gives a fuck, basically. Then you look for Orpers, bro, the list is just skadoodle, and then my list just ends. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the joke, I'm, unironically, I'm not just saying this because he's big and valorant. Unironically, fucking Shazam might be number two on that list. You know what I mean? Like, who else even is there? Who was an Orpo from NA? Like, there barely was any. And by the way, the saddest thing about the junior angle that Maui pointed out is, the reason you will all think Junior sucks forever is because stupidly he decided to go and play in a fucking Brazilian team, even though he's yeah. from NA. Yeah. Like, why he did that, I'll never understand because that absolutely tanked his stock forever. And even worse, this is actually a relevant point I'm going to make here. This is why I also think stylistically NA doesn't use AWPers and doesn't play around them. The worst thing about joining a team where you aren't like insanely fluent in their language, it's just not your culture, is bro, AWP is not the position to do that. I know people have this vision because they play in matchmaking of an AWP as a self 
selfish player who plays off on the side of the map. He does whatever he wants. That's not pro CS. You know what I described at the beginning of the episode about how Blade uses Wonderful? He uses Wonderful almost as like a dividing line, as a setup, as like a backup in insurance policy when a guy checks it. Use it to come in and clear out the back of his he, They're using that very precisely. The problem you have in NA is if you are the AWPA, you just don't get any setup or support. So good luck. It's like when OC and Junior did play in these top teams. Remember when fucking OC played on Liquid? Bro, he never had a, hook, a chance. He never got a setup for anything. The joke is Cadian used to set himself up in Heroic better than OC ever was in Team Liquid just because Cadian was the IGL. So if you look at the great AWPAs, they all have like a fucking almost like a bodyguard with them in real teams or someone who plays off them or someone who watches a flank or someone who ensures that they never have to worry about anything except this crosshair here. And so, yeah, I think that's I think that's an angle that people massively miss. It's like even if you did the role, I don't think you'll ever get the setup in your team because I think almost every NA team still does have that essence of like we play, we play a bit poggy, we play off aggressive rifle play. And you think of NA teams, you think of deagles, you think of people just wide swinging and getting a 2K with headshots. It's like, it's not a region that essentially plays like the slow tactical op style of CS. So, unfortunately, I actually agree. Uh, if you have an NA team, historically, they often needed imports anyway. But if you were to make one today, you'd have to, like, the joke is Holzerk is the best option and he isn't from NA. Like, there isn't anyone else to take at that role. And for things like IGL, that's also just been left to die. I just listed all those names from CS. None of them are around anymore. There's just tennis law at a low level. And Daps is what a coach. Like, that's it. So, I mean, I guess Nitro came back recently, but no one has any clue if he's sticking around. Is he going to put in his... So, you're, you're, it's pretty thin on the ground right now. And the reason that's brutal is you've still got the stars. You've still got Twist, Silesia, Naf. They're right there still. Like... In theory, all we need is one or two players to come through and we can build another super team. But right now, it's not going to be an NA super team. I'm with King T. Right now, it's actually why almost every convo that I know Cole Org hates, by the way, is, guys, we have to kick someone and bring another European. We just have to. Like, it's obviously the way we're going to make this team better, aren't we? So, just a sad state of affairs. Mm -hmm. But I also think, like I say, I feel like it's a it's a problem that didn't just occur today. It sort of has its genesis in almost how they've played CSGO the whole time. Yeah, kind of has. And also, I think to touch on the Malb's point, because, you know, he did escape the chains of NA, as it were, but he did the start... The skibbity toilet of NA, you mean, but yeah, keep going, whatever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are Zoomers here, yeah. Uh, no, he, is, he started his career in Brazil, and also, he has something that seems to be distinctly lacking in NA scene, which is a combination of skill and humility. Okay. I don't think that combination comes along very often, just based off what I've understood of North American players. I love the way you're already the biggest villain ever on this episode, bro, because not only did you come on with a British accent going, I'm just going to shit on NA again, but now you're going, it's it's your lack of humility, you Americans. You're so, <laughs> so, I love it. They're, they're going to be, to yeah. you, we all, you're like a villain from a, like a, a fucking 20th century Hollywood movie right now, King T. You should have like an actual monocle, a top heart, and a fucking cane with a diamond encrusted thing. Like, get down, you little peasant. Like, go on, hit me with it. Give me the rant. Give me the rant. <laughs> <laughs> but no it's something they do need to understand is that yeah talent with ego just isn't going to get them there and that's one thing Malbs was able to demonstrate that he really doesn't have is an excessive ego the fact that he is willing to go and step into g2 and be a, a tr basically a support player and have one map out of seven they understand how to use him from the get-go like that's an absurd uh, risk to take um but no that's pretty much what i wanted to end on it's just if there were na players coming up they need to be formed in that sort of environment. They need to understand that they are not the be all end all of the team. Having 25 kills is only having 25 kills. The stat that matters is 13 now. It's winning the actual map. And I don't think enough of them are focused on that. So that's my that's my main takeaway at the end there. Yep. Yeah, it's it's uh I, I mean there's so much ego in NA that I still I still gloat about the fact that I, I beat Mobs in an online match six years ago <laughs> so i have to i have to take my wins where i can he really did come out of the bin pit then i guess then fucking hell this guy <laughs> elevated his career didn't he all right <laughs> yeah what is your uh, ugly then maui mine is just it's just such a such a tired discussion that you know i mean we're just coming off the player break there's only so many things that have happened so far so i'm just kind of taking a a concept that i've kind of just been frustrating to me for the past like I don't know, maybe the entire time I've been talking about this game is sample size discussions. This has just been the the lamest point I possibly can read regarding practically anything, uh, invoking just like any any semblance of a trend that you're noticing, you're just going to be immediately combated with 
but must sample size. And it's just so exhausting to try to point out trends to practically anybody because it almost feels like nothing's ever satisfactory. Like you, you almost, if you, if you talk about the first, I don't know, you talk about the first half of the year, then it's like, well, these aren't the, this isn't your, the final top 20. If you talk about the first tournament for a team, then, then, oh, you know, you got to give them more time. You got to give them several more months, but if you see snacks doing well and getting to a grand final, suddenly the sample size is great. Some suddenly it's okay that it's just it's just a single tournament after the player break, and suddenly sample size doesn't matter anymore because everybody just uses it to to their own to fit their own narratives as much as they possibly can. And I feel feel like if anything, I'm just someone that tries to report trends as soon as possible. Uh, if I see something going on for for five maps for two series consecutively, I'm noticing a trend. I'm going to say something about it. But somebody, so there always has to be somebody that says, "Pardon the sample size," or "Excuse the fact that it's only a couple series." But it's like we can we can notice trends. We can we're allowed to do that. We're allowed to see something and say that this is happening right now. And it almost feels like to me and what's so frustrating about this whole conversation is that I think the people that are actually invoking the fact that it's a quote unquote low sample size are the people that are suddenly they, they, they haven't been watching. So they say you can't go against the narrative that I had constructed three months prior to this one because I haven't watched everything and caught up with it like you have. And that's what, where it gets, just gets so upsetting and frustrating. And I also just want to say, like, taking big narrative points from what happened here at EWC, whether it's like, oh, Navi's not a fluke, that's one of them, um, G2's already good because they got to the finals here. It's like, haven't we already learned through the past, I don't know, eight starts of seasons that the blast spring and fall groups are generally where the most upsets happen in any single tournament throughout the entire year and that is why those are formatted in multi-elimination group stages so that the teams can just shake off the cobwebs and ring rust from the player break and get back into playing form so i feel like this is again it's just the discussions go in so many different ways all of the time and because i feel like the ewc is labeled as a world cup with a huge prize pool we're suddenly disregarding a lesson that we have learned so many times in years prior to this that the first tournament after a player break should probably not be credited as as highly and so I, like this has kind of gone on to a couple different places but i just find i find personally sample size discussions to be very exhausting and are generally a way to almost like stop an argument before it even starts and that just kind of leads to a lack of stimulation Hmm. Yeah, I get your complaint. And especially for me, the big one that annoys me is if I, I see a big thing happen in a tournament that's clearly a change from the previous one, I don't care if it's been two maps of the tournament, I've noticed a difference and a trend. Like that's enough for me to start commenting on it. Um, but essentially what this entire discussion boils down to is that you want the average Counter-Strike uh, like interactor, I guess you want to call it. So they're not just a player, they're someone who actually watched the scene and is willing to argue about it online, to be incredibly rational. Mm -hmm. And that's impossible. Thankfully, it is because that dries up interaction. So please, everyone, please keep sure. being crazy. G2 fans in my comments, every time I say yes. the Snacks G2 team isn't going to work, sure. please keep boosting my engagement. Be insane. I'm down for it. I really don't mind that I'm right and you're wrong. That's great. <laughs> it drives up interaction and it makes me feel great. So I, I'm not opposed to it. I think I get what you're saying. Um, and especially it'd be frustrating if I was talking to someone who has knowledge in the game and maybe has just missed a little thing and they try to shut it down on that basis. But if it's the average viewer, the average commenter, go nuts. I don't mind if they want to be completely uh, blind to the realities of things changing, things developing. That's okay with me. Uh, it just gets me more views. This is why I always do get low key tilted by that famous like corp that people say about HL TV forums. You've probably seen it. You know that stupid thing where they go, Reddit is where stupid people go to pretend to be smart, but HL TV is where smart people go to be pretend to be stupid. <laughs> and it's like, bro, you aren't fucking like part of the Stanislavski method acting school, dickhead. You just are those people, and those are your thoughts. Like it's the other way around. What you know the you know the the stereotype of a HLTV thread that goes Donk fans come here after he has his one bad tournament and then they go he is shit and sucks no no that is how fans think that is not the outlier that's actually how the average fan thinks I mean I was having this conversation with King T on the live view right he's a Messi fan and I'm a Ronaldo fan right
right? But one thing that I can't handle is we're fans of the players and how great they are. If you just want to find whack angles, you can do it for everyone. Like, the reason why I get irritated is I was actually there. I, I wasn't somebody who started following football two years ago, King T. So I, I remember when Messi came along in like the mid 2000s, and then when he got really mm. good towards the end of the 2000s. And I'll tell you what, every Messi fan who was like one of these sorts of HLTV fans, when they took their list of cynical angles, one angle they never brought up before 2022, King T, you'll know this, is nobody who was a Messi yeah. fan ever, ever said international play was really important for obvious reasons. Because, spoiler, we were both in the same boat. Our dudes were supposed to be the goats and none of them ever scored a World Cup knockout goal. We all know it. In fact, I even made a meme at the last World Cup, like, bro, Harry Kane has scored them. Like, and it, fucking these two haven't. So, <laughs> no fan of Messi ever wanted international to count. But I'll tell you what, the second he won the World Cup, suddenly that's all that counts. Suddenly, all of history doesn't matter. That's, now you can only be the GOAT if you've won a World Cup. So you can see that's a perfect modern example where if that's what sports fans are going to be like, well, the, in the modern day, the, the 17-year-old kid who's a plastic Messi fan is the same kid who's probably a fan of G2. And see, you know what I mean? It, it may as well be the same guy. So I agree with King T. You're never, ever going to get past this, unfortunately. Essentially, in a weird way, what does generate the sort of heat and the hype and the sheer engagement in our scene is that people overreact to every little small thing. It's why, actually, I'll tell you a reason why Richard Lewis often gets flamed by fans who hate on him and thinks he doesn't know the game. It's because in the modern and dear, when they themselves aren't giving a hot take like that, they just go, because the other angle that's infuriating is when they don't watch the game, they just go off stats, don't they? So suddenly sample size is everything. So the same fan doesn't watch a match and they go and look. And when Richard's talking, he's going only off eye test. He watched a game and in this one game he was watching, this player carried or had a bunch of good rounds. So he might say something, I think he's a really good player. They'll go and look at his stats and maybe the stats like aren't that great for three months or something. You know, the rating's not as good or that was like a one match here. So they're essentially... They, they, have it, they have their cake and eat it on this all the time. And then I think the obvious example of this whole sample size thing is this actual EWC final. Because first of all, this is so insane. I agree, Maui. It's just because it was Blast Group Stage made people tank the aggro of like, these events are shit for showing how good you are. I mean, I'll give you the obvious example. Because remember... Right? That's the reason I've always said I hate that Team Liquid fucking run at Starladder Berlin. Because it was a major right after the player break. And we're now seeing player breaks produce the worst actual, like, reliable results afterwards. I mean, here's the best example in history. Do you remember at the beginning of 2023, there was a very famous opening game between EG and Heroic? <laughs> now think about this, HLTV, come here fans. You, by your logic, if before that game, King T did a video and said, I think this EG like, is just not very good. Like, they're not going to accomplish anything. I don't think they'll have any deep placings. After that one game, your replies would have been full of, like, listen, it's well, lol, what do you know about the game? But the joke would be, that was the only result they had all year. The whole year. Like, that's why it's the best example ever, because you would all say he was wrong. But because you hadn't given any sample size, it was one match, you would then discover that he would have been right for, like, almost every single match played for the whole year. And you would be the one who took an outrageous take from one match. So I think that proves it right there. And then if you just watch this final, watch. I'll break down both sides. So I said it on the Nico point already. JL and Bit have both done the same thing. Funnily enough, this is one of the only times it was ever at the same event. They've both had these insane events that are MVP caliber, but they've both done it roughly two or three times out of, let's say, 10 or 12 events, right? So it's not it's not consistent at all. But you notice when King T says he has that conversation, who can we remove? Bro, you dare mention one of these and you'd think they were doing this every event. I mean, I actually, this is why I don't give fans any quarter, Maui, because it's actually insulting the inference. They're implying that these guys do what Bit just did now every tournament and we're the bozos trying to like put the fucking, the, 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 the rectangle into the ceiling. It doesn't fit, it doesn't fit, they're just Bad. <laughs> like, you, you dumb motherfuckers, every time we actually have a great team that we love, you tell them we're all glazing and literally glizzy gluck 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 9000 in their dicks. <laughs> but simultaneously, apparently, we just hate on the amazing Na'Vi. No, they're obviously not fucking that good, are they? We're watching with our... Uh, the worst thing is we're watching like Malcolm and Clockwork. We're just like, what? Please, no more! Because it doesn't happen except like two events out of ten. So then also, the Snacks one's the perfect one, Maui. I guarantee so many shitheads after my harsh takes on snacks in this new lineup had it queued up when they made this final. Like, oh, I thought it was wrong. Are you ready for a stat? That's a banger, right? So remember at this tournament, it wasn't a large sample size tournament. G2 played 10 maps. 
right? Two of those maps were the opener against Mongols, which were about, which was so fucking close, you could have slid like fucking a, a Russian player's visa to the US between them. Like, they could have lost that series 2 0. There's two of the 10 maps, by the way. That's 20% of the tournament. I'm using King T, Team Liquid style percentages to make it sound sicker. <laughs> and then in the final, I actually think, like, I think he was all right on calling on ancient, but the other two maps, he was terrible snacks. So there's two more maps. Right? right, I've already got four maps out of the 10. He's not even calling a great game. Then all of a sudden, you've just got like two series. That's all it was. It was actually, you guys, you guys overreacted to two series and tried to tell me that the old star player non-IGL of Virtus Pro from 2017 is like an elite IGL already in the first fluke-ass tournament. Which, by the way... I agree with you, Maui. The damage that calling that tournament World Cup has done to our sanity and fans trying to, like, pump up the relevance of this tournament is mental. Like, this event right now is, for my opinion, it's on the level of, like, a blast final. It hasn't yet got... Look, the money's six. I'll give it this credit. I do think in future years, if they put a real group stage in, it could be... It won't be kind of eight but it could be, like, just below that. It could be in the next tier of events that we all, like, the I Am Dallas, etc. Those sorts of events. But, no, it wasn't for now. So, I actually think this recent event's even a great example how people just go way too far with the narratives way too far especially because also isn't one thing that you, we all love about cs because actually you get to play so many lands it's actually a yeah. brilliant game for drawing out large sample sizes and looking at like six months of play and you get all the different match like compared to games like league of legends guys it's way better in this game to actually get a real sense of who people are in league of legends if you do a fluky run, run at worlds you'll be remembered for that whole years of being like some top yep. team but maybe you would just go to your good at one tournament like i think this is actually a strength of our scene it's just the problem is to bring it back i think we just have a lot of young fans who just they, they just live in the moment i mean i, I was about to do uh, one of those mad rants like drinking their bloody sunny d and all those e numbers and sugar and they're all just fucking you know you're all just getting ready to win a winner chicken dinner in your battle royale all because you can't just fucking sit down and enjoy some classic Counter-Strike, some strats. It's a way, if anyone actually did, if someone was a fan and you actually watched CS with me, it would be a struggle session. I'd just make you learn like what the strats were, what the execute was. I'd be pointing out the anchor guy. Oh, you'd, hate, you'd hate it. Go, go back to watching the fireworks show, you fucking morons. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, I think that covered it sufficiently. Okay. Right, my la the last point of the show is intentionally chosen to sort of address a past... It might even have been the last episode, I forget. We did that one where the whole snap tap rops controversy had come up of this keyboard that does like an even better version of what the wooting thing does, where essentially the idea is like you can essentially do two inputs at once. So there's no longer like a timing difference between pressing strafe left and strafe right. There's no longer like, oh, I have to wait till the key comes. It just does it instantly. Now, the problem is I haven't used that keyboard. In fact, most people don't seem to have used that keyboard except certain pros. And so we were going, as you saw in the episode, off I Googled what is the explanation from the company of what this feature does. And because they just made it sound, as I said, I gave the contrast of think about going from a membrane keyboard to like a one where it has actual proper fucking mechanical keyboard to, to this just sounded like the next evolution. And I gave the analogy of, ball mouse to optical to laser right we could look they all would give you an advantage but the question is is this just something which if we all get it just makes the game better i actually naively at the time thought this was just like an upgrade in that sense like hopefully i was hoping it just essentially means you want like a misclick or something and now nico and D no don't call these guys will be just studied after watching, I'll give credit, I'll actually tell the editor to link this. Flom did an interesting video where he looked at a bunch of stuff actually in Valorant of people using this keyboard. And I have to say, now I get, because Rops actually reached out to me. Now I get why people like Rops do apparently think it's cheating. Like essentially they think the problem is, it's not that it's like allowing more skill expression. To them, it just raises the flaw of like how everyone yep. clicks to get too much. And it's going to make it so that like, essentially, in the, this is why the analogy is jump throw binds and scripts, right? If you have that, the problem with the jump throw bind is everyone can do it every time whereas i can tell you and everyone who plays pro cs knows this there are loads of smoke lineups that actually only really sick pros can do and people have put in mad hours doing it so i think it's more comparable to that so actually i'm i wanted to put in ugly because i'm not actually totally sure myself i haven't used it still where it comes down but i want to open the conversation because it seems like there's more there than maybe we led on in that in that particular episode you know yeah it's very powerful. Like when I see the description initially and I hear that it's supposed to help you with counter strafing, I did think it was just some weird like advanced ghosting software built in or something that was actually built in like the like some sort of firmware maybe that just But it turns out the reality is that it's 
beyond insane. Like, in theory, what they've done isn't that crazy, but its applications in Counter-Strike are insanely potent. It goes from essentially being, Counter-Strafing being a process where you've got to understand the timing of it and feel it and know when you're supposed to start shooting to just the moment you touch your counter key, you can shoot. Which in Counter-Strike we've never had before without using scripts. Uh, so that's why it feels the same as really cheating did before. And when you watch it in practice, how you can play with this level of tapping precision between your movement keys, if everyone has access to this, the game will be reduced to a weird like game of oscillating deathmatch. It's, it's very mm -hmm. silly looking. And I think, honestly, for the, for the sanity of gamers <laughs> and the sanctity of events coming forward, it has to just be removed. It, I personally cannot stand to see this in, in the game because it would just make a lot of things farcically easy. Yeah, this is one of the, I think, the rare times that Thorin and I don't just, like, usually if we have a take about something, I think we're, we're ready to defend it. But there's just been enough that has come out that it, you can't, I can't double down on this. It just is like, after seeing more clips come out, more YouTube videos about what this keyboard is able to do, and I think now Wooting has imp implemented the same feature in some sort of, like, firmware right. update, it, it seems like that there's, there's too much you you gain way too much from doing this and it's not like it, it doesn't seem like there's enough use cases where it's like oh but using this actually hurts you in this specific way it seems almost purely beneficial and because it's taking away some of the skill aspect of counter strafing which is obviously one of the fundamental mechanics of the game it's almost like i, I think the the easiest way i can equate it after watching more and more videos is imagine you can always do the the sure you can uppercut with like a single motion in a fighting game like it takes it takes like a count it takes like a quarter circle to do that motion normally and that's your anti-aerial move in a fighting game if someone jumps against you that's what you do and i feel like now with this keyboard it's almost like you're just pressing one key to do what should be a multi-key movement and i actually remember this happening on esca back when i was i'm pretty sure back when i was playing source and there was a <clears throat> discussion on those forums or someone made alias binds for the first time about how you it was it was a bind that made it so that if you're holding w and a or w and d it's it's it, i mean it's known if you're holding those keys it is notoriously hard to counter strafe when you're holding two movement keys because you would have to press the opposing s and d or s and a keys to stop your mo momentum and not many people could do it that's why people that's why professionals don't run around holding w d w a and i actually fear with snap tap now you can just hold diagonal movements and then you could just counter strafe perfectly with that also right. like that's what i don't even think people you can almost like talk buffer the movement that. basically right yeah it, it, it that would be that's game breaking yeah. in terms of the way we in, even envision fights because we're so used to just having to hold d and hold and then press a to counter strafe but now you can actually i think you can do diagonal motions too and and the people were showing on reddit yeah you can just flat out hold w run forward and instantly counter strafe backwards you have never been able to do that in counter strike that's why you never see people charging forward in fights you generally want to see people strafe perpendicularly to their opponent because it's the easiest way to counter strafe for them and that's the muscle memory that they built over so much time and now and like there's a way you can see this that's like oh won't this make the game better overall but it's just that this is such a fundamental aspect to developing mechanical skill that if you're going to start allowing this it, it really feels like this is a slippery slope in terms of what you can allow with multi-key aliasing that can seriously break the mechanics and really just yeah it, it doesn't necessarily i don't know if it raises the ceiling as much as it just raises the floor and to me that's flawed because counter strafing is just such an essential part of this game